Welcome back to the Name Redacted Podcast, America's most beloved podcast, the most downloaded Red Sox podcast in the world. Red Sox Reddit's least favorite Red Sox podcast. They can all suck my dick in hell. Everyone, everyone wow. in Red Sox Reddit can suck my dick in hell. Yeah, that was a very mean thread that they had the other day. There was like a whole thread about like they just hate us. I don't know why. Really? I, yeah. I think it's just, you know, once you uh once you kind of like first of all, it's different. The the comparison that I've been using is that like if if you it's it's almost like if uh you expected wings to sound the same as the Beatles. Like of course it's it's a different band. I, I don't get it. It's we don't we don't call ourselves Section Ten. It's a different show. It's a name redacted podcast. If if Paul is no longer in the Beatles and starts a different band, Wings, it's not going to sound like the Beatles because it's a different band. I don't even think that's it. Yeah, I'm going to compare I, it. I think this show is pretty similar to Section Ten in in a lot of ways, but like it's kind of sort of. Yeah, I I think we carry a similar vibe, but the big I I think it's like this: you're no longer like the up and coming artist. You are now like the mainstream artist. And when you get to that like mainstream level where you're kind of the big dog in the community, and it's you're fun established to hate the to this point. Thing. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. People it's, are going to shit yeah. on you either way. Yeah, yeah. It's fun to hate the thing that's that's uh, mainstream. And I don't even think that we're mainstream. We're just fucking. It's still Pete and like the house that he grew up in, and uh, like I, I don't know. It's it's very I don't know. People people are just angry right now. But we're not going to harp on that. A lot of good things happen. A lot of good things happen. A lot of things that we wanted to have happen. <clears throat> There's my mom. Hi, my Ellen. Mom's in the background. Hi, Ellen. Everyone said hi, Ellen. I love you. Said hi. Don't say that. I said it last week, and she said I love you too. Oh, she did. <laughs> she, she did. <laughs> yeah. Um. <clears throat> uh. This past week, Red Sox made some moves. Some of them, actually. You know what I want to do? You know what we're gonna do on this podcast? We're gonna get Jake involved here as well. Uh, we are going to construct what we believe, <clears throat> not four separate. We are going to have a discussion. We're going to move pieces around. We are going to come up with the Red Sox opening day lineup on this particular pro- program today. We're going to come up with the Red Sox opening day lineup based on uh, the moves that have been made. First and foremost, Jorge Alfaro. Was it a minor league deal, Tyler? Yes, minor league deal. If he minor makes, league deal. Yep, makes the big league roster. He'll get $2 million. And there's opt-outs on June 1st and July 1st if he's not in the big leagues. And then last night, he announced his own signing to the Boston Red Sox, Rymel Tapia. Correct. Who you may remember as the gentleman who hit an inside the park grand slam with uh, Jaron Duran losing the ball in the lights <laughs> and just like not running after it. <clears throat> One of the worst nights of my life being at that game and just seeing... Uh, Seeing, I mean, th- what was the final score that night? It was like 25 to three or something. I think it was even worse. 28, that, wasn't it? right? Yeah, I think it was 28 They almost scored to 30 five. runs. 28 to five. And they didn't score in like the last couple innings, right? Or like the last, because I remember they had 28 and I was like, fuck, they're going to hit 30. Mm. <laughs> it was, that was the night that I was out to dinner and it was like the second inning and they had scored 14 runs and like, uh, like t- I took like a twenty minute ride home, and it would score like twenty six to t- to nothing or twenty six to two or something. I was like, oh, okay, I'm not gonna pay attention to this team anymore. Mm. Yeah, Blue Jays scored twenty five runs in the first five innings of that game. <laughs> Sick. No team had, had done that in any game in the last hundred years. Mm. <sighs> yeah, that wasn't great. Twenty twenty two Red great. Sox, baby. I didn't have a good time that night. Bad time. Uh, and then the Red Sox also signing Adam Duvall. What were the terms of that deal, Tyler? He ended up getting seven million on that one year deal, and it can be up to ten million with incentives based off plate appearances. Okay. Uh, but before we get to all that, before we really break that down, uh, we have to have a moment of silence for uh for some reason. Uh, I'm very confusing situation here with Pat Light. A lot of people were like, is this p-? people thought that the Pat Light thing was a bit because of Pete. Pete had an announcement, said he was <laughs> making an announcement like, I don't know, like two months ago. And the announcement that was that he was going to be on the podcast, it wasn't that people thought that he was leaving. Uh, so people thought that that was this. I'll just I'll just read to you because I'm just as if you if you're listening to this and you're confused, I'm just as confused as you are. <laughs> <laughs> so Pat Light texts me uh, on Monday. What today time? is what? Uh, 3.40 p.m. Jared, my good friend. <laughs> 
And I said, Patrick, how are we? And he said, I'm terrific. How are you? And I said, outstanding. And he said, happy to hear that. I unfortunately do come with bad news though. And I said, uh-oh. Because the last time, uh, the last time that Pat texted me that he had bad news, it was that someone was fucking my wife. <laughs> and then he says, yeah, due to my current schedule, my mom's in the background, by the way. Yeah. But you don't have no, you can just you no. can stay there if you want. I'm just saying that like I She already knows that you your know, wife was getting fucked. Yeah, I'm you already knew about my wife. No, not not telling any she tales did. out of school here. Yeah, no, you can you can hang out in the background if you want. <clears throat> uh Pat says, Yeah, due to my current schedule and what would appear my future schedule is going to be, I think it's best I step back from the podcast. Still happy to join the show from time to time, but my life is about as hectic as it gets, and it's not fair to you or the guys keeping me a part of it in an official capacity. Uh, so essentially, Pat is announcing that his role is going to remain the same for <laughs> the next season because how is that any different than how he operated this year? Like you, how many, how many, Jake, how many episodes did you say Pat was on this past season? Like 10 ish? Probably like 12 or 13. Okay. And we, what episode is this? 70? 67. Hey, Ellen, you mind putting your phone on fucking silent or doing a podcast? <laughs> uh, Thank you. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I think that my, my announcement was more significant than this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pete announcing that he was doing an episode. People were amped about that. Pat, I think it was more more likely that I was going to quit the podcast than it was likely that Pat was going to take a bigger role on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Pat saying, like, let me read this again. Due to my current schedule and what would appear my future schedule is going to be, I think it's best I step back from the podcast. Still happy to join the show from time to time. That's not my a step life back. Is a, <laughs> it's it's, not, it's, it's the exact... Mic. It's it, been a month. Still, I'm still happy to join the show from time to time, but my life is about as hectic as it gets, and it's not fair to you guys to keep keeping me around in any official capacity. I, I think he just wanted to clear up space in his Twitter bio. I think he just wanted to be like, hey, I'm not officially on... The I, it was probably getting to him when people would tweet him being like, dude, why the fuck aren't you on the podcast? Blah, blah, blah. Like, you never show up, this and that. And he probably felt bad about... Like, okay, I'm officially listed as a co host, mm -hmm. but I never show up versus like, yeah, you want the ability to come and go as you please. But in my mind, my mind was different from the listeners. I think the listeners were like, where the fuck are you? Show up. Like, you're not pulling your weight. In my mind, I was just happy to have Pat whenever he decided to show up. Like, I was never pressuring him to be there. I yeah. was never like, dude, you need to step it the fuck up. Like, I don't do that. Like, I'm just happy to have Pat whenever he wants. So, that, in my eyes, his role is the same. That, that makes the most sense. Like, I think that. I want to believe that people were conditioned to like not expect him to be here, but I'm sure he was getting a lot of like, yo, where the fuck are you? Or like, hey, it would be nice if you showed up once in a while for the podcast that you're a co-host for. But like, I don't know, it, it, make, it bums me out that he framed it as like, I don't want to let you guys down because it's not like when he didn't show up, we would show up for recording and be like, where the fuck is Pat? What an no, asshole. Sometimes. It, well, we all like just came to expect that like Pat may may not be here, and when he was here, it was a nice little treat, mm -hmm. and it'll still be a nice little treat when he shows up. But I don't think that anybody was upset by like him doing his work stuff or like going on dates and, and not showing up at the podcast. Like that's whatever. Uh, yeah. And what's weirder is like it sounds like there's a tone of guilt here. Like that was kind of <laughs> bothering him for some time. He wouldn't even text back sometimes when we asked if we were doing the pod. Like, by no means were we holding Pat here hostage and saying you had to be here. It was just like, anytime you want to show up and say hello, the door is open. We just, yeah. we want you to know we care. and We like you. I think and You know what it probably is? I, I, my theory is that um, when Steve left, as the story goes, I texted Pat to join the show while I was still on the phone with Steve, who was telling me that he was leaving. Like Steve is That's like, yeah, man, up. 
<laughs> Steve was like, it was a really tough decision. And I, you know, I, I got to leave the podcast. That's fucked like, up. Yeah, that's like, get, that's I like, was like, yeah, yeah, that sucks. That sucks. I'm, I'm texting Pat. I'm like, bro, let's go. That's like your, girl, like, that's like your girlfriend <laughs> breaking up with you. And like, as she's telling you, you're texting like another girl being like, yo, I'm single. That's fuck. Well, it's, it's not even, it's not even, it, it's not disrespect to Steve. It's more, I'm, I'm making sure that Pat is coming on with us before Steve can be like, hey, do you want to join my other show? So that's what that was. And no, I don't know that. I don't know that Steve would have asked. I know that other podcasts have tried to get Pat and Pat. Pat's not in it for the money. Like, that's the thing. Like, Pat is just a loyal friend. So other podcasts have tried to get Pat and Pat's like, I don't give a fuck like what you pay me. Like, my loyalty is to Jared, which is like, very much appreciated, but totally unnecessary. I want Pat to do whatever Pat wants to do. Uh, I want Pat to make the most money that he can make. And apparently what he wants to do and what's going to make him the most happy and the most money is apparently just <laughs> buying a bunch of bars and becoming this this businessman. And and when he said goodbye to baseball, Pat, his his Twitter is now corporate Pat. <laughs> he is... His his profile picture is him in like a suit with like a comb over. It's a he LinkedIn like a profile. Fucking, that part, it's a LinkedIn profile. That part is is yeah. more confusing to me than the announcement about the podcast. Like yeah. his his identity rebrand is fucking confusing to me because, yeah. but, but like I get it from like a his business perspective, but like I don't think it was required to have. A, like a like a full rebrand because no. he's like we're not going to just like forget that part of his identity and neither should he it's like a chapter of his life guys and it's it's why he has a following yeah and like and it's it's like still he's allowed to ha be a businessman now who was a baseball player nobody was like mm -hmm. whoa 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 you're not allowed to own bars you used to play baseball <laughs> like, right Mm. It, you just look at the last tweet. This was 19 minutes ago. He tweeted out top Twitter business profiles to follow. If you scroll down every single tweet, it's either me, Jared, or Pete Tag, uh, and Coley a few <laughs> times as well. <laughs> like, what were you hoping was going to happen? Did you think everyone was just going to start tweeting stocks like, oh, at no, you? No, it's and business bars? Pat. It's business Pat. Yeah. Has, yeah. has anybody totally checked in on his TikTok? Has he gone back and deleted every single baseball TikTok that he posted? He, I don't know, but he has, uh, I thought the light group was a joke. The light group apparently is a real thing. His Twitter bio now says founder slash CEO of the light group in a former life. I played for the Boston Red Sox and struck out Mike Trout. His business pod is now sorry we're closed and he's removed this podcast from his bio, which, which is fine. <clears throat> um, that's fine. But he uh, is he's all business Pat now. And <laughs> this very funny tweet from Jake where Pat tweeted out podcast slash media request. And then he, he put the email to, for his, his uh, podcast and media request. And Jake put together an email, said, to whom it may concern, we are a Red Sox podcast in need of a new segment. And we believe Pat Light is the answer. We'd love to have him on the <laughs> pod to do Pat's picks where he ranks his top five picks of a random category of our choosing. We like to stay away from the controversy, so we're thinking of starting simple with Pat's top five favorite U.S. Supreme <laughs> Court decisions. <laughs> Let us know if he has any availability. Big fan of the light group and everything you guys do from the Name Redacted podcast. Well, I mean, I would Jake. love to get him on. I would love to get him on, especially now that, you know, you don't just get, like, the president and CEO of the light group on your podcast every day, so... I know that you know that that is just a, it's, it's it's a hard thing to do, um, but yeah, I I I wish Pat and I know that he'll be successful because he is a very smart businessman. There's definitely some people out there where they just do these career pivots, and you're like, yeah, good luck with that, pal. Like that's not going to work out. I know Pat is going to be very successful because he already is successful in the business world. It's more just like. You know how anything works when you're building something up. It's like, all right, it starts off slow, but then you double it, and then you this grow. It's like a pyramid. He's running a pyramid <laughs> scheme. Uh, it it just it it gets easier to grow at the pace that he wants to grow at. But um, 
I just it, yeah. Just whenever wanna... he wants to come back, he can come back. There's there's no door closed here. There's no. Uh, I think he was expecting us to be sad or disappointed. But what I was saying earlier, my theory of why he holds so much guilt, I think, is because he thought of himself or he thought that I thought of him as Steve's replacement. Because when Steve left, I immediately asked Pat to do the podcast and he never obviously contributed the same amount of time and effort that Steve did. So he probably felt like he let us down. Pat didn't let us down. Anytime that that Pat gave the podcast was obviously very much uh, enjoyed by the listeners and by us. And he was very funny. And his his player insight was great. The way that he was able to do Pat's picks on a whim, he obviously never prepared for that. So the fact that he was able to just do that uh, at the drop of a dime was very... Th- that That's why it was funny. It wouldn't have been as funny if he actually prepared for it. It was him scrambling to come up with five things for a topic uh, at the drop of a hat. So yeah, whenever Pat wants to come back, he can come back. And I'm sure he will. I'm sure that there will be times throughout the course of the season that uh, he'll get the itch again. I don't think that baseball Pat is completely dead. Um, but I'm just glad that he has to, the freedom to, to talk about other things now. Because famously, he was not allowed to talk about anything other than baseball before this big rebrand and big right. announcement. Yeah, I don't know. Just <clears throat> the, the society just completely oppressed him and uh, forced him to only talk about baseball all the time. There's a few too many baseball tweets over the last 24 hours for me to believe that version of Pat Light is fully dead. But I will say... It sits with me a little weird, and it hurts me that the final moments, possibly, of Pat on this podcast were during the first ever edition of Mr. Milliken, where he got so bored that he didn't even say goodbye. He just hung up the call. There was never an apology, never a word. So if you're looking to blame someone for pushing Pat Light away from baseball, I ruined baseball for Pat Light. The guy I believed in when he was in double A. I want carving dudes up. I want everybody, like all of... uh like whenever he chimes in on baseball from now on, I want people to respond and be like, "What the fuck do you know about baseball?" <laughs> yeah. Business guy, <laughs> yeah, business boy. And then when he responds, yeah. I used to pitch for the Red Sox. Be like, I don't think mm. so. Just looks like you're a, a businessman, a CEO. Yeah, that's uh, end of an era. But I don't think the era is over. It's just you can't you can't be the guy that. Literally never shows up, comes and goes as he pleases and be like, you know what? I'm going to take a step back and just I'm going to I'm going to do the podcast when I can. <laughs> that is quite literally what you've done the entire time. That's why he's the best. I love him. That's why he's him. the love best. You, Pat. <laughs> Pat Light next week. Yeah, that's why he's the best. He just uh, I think he just wanted one final standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> just the final tip of the cap. Yeah, he he basically wanted like a uh, a jersey retirement ceremony for his Twitter profile picture. Like that's <laughs> yeah. that's what this is about. Yeah, fair. But I will say uh the, the the business headshot, he does look he does look very handsome. Oh yeah, he looks great. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a way better picture. Yeah, for sure. Cuz like I think that I'm so conditioned to like when I see someone in my mentions and they have like a picture of an MLB player I'm like, okay, so you're a 14 year old Yankee. Fan. Like, it's like if you have like a picture of Nestor Cortez as your Twitter avatar, then it's like, all right, you're a 14 year old Yankee fan. Like, that's great. You're passionate about the sport so much so that you'd rather have a Yankee than your actual picture. So Pat Light's picture of him walking back to the Red Sox dugout to a course of booze because of how terrible he was. Uh, that it, in my mind, I, I look at that and I'm like, oh, it's it's kind of yes, it's you, but I feel like in, your brain plays tricks on you. It's like, well, that's not actually you. Now it's a very professional mm-hmm. picture. You have professional Pat, business guy Pat. It is uh it's something to behold. So yeah, there's it's onward and upward for the light group. Mm-hmm. And they have nothing but our full support. I'm gonna join the light group. I told you that. I, I feel like at some point, <clears throat> if the light group is in is in the business of acquiring a bar in the Fenway area. I'll be part of the light group for that. Same. And, and Pat Light will be in the Boston area. I don't want to start any rumors this month. So who knows? We might have a new Did bar he say coming. it's this month? I thought he said May. He said Was the end May? of this month. Oh. So who knows? Okay. I'll be upset. You never know. I'm going to be out of town uh, last, last week of this month. So mm. I'll be upset if I miss Pat. I've never like fully gotten the Pat 
uh, night out experience. Yeah, because you ditched us the last fucking time. I didn't ditch you. I was just too. Yes, you did. I was too high. <laughs> that's that is that's that not is excuse. not a ditch. That's a, that's a ditch. No, it's not. Did you know in advance? Did you know in advance? You had no excuse. Yeah, but you but, but you before, got in that condition before by being you took there. the substances. Before you took the substances, did you know that we were all going to be together that night? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I, I thought that I would be in, in a, a decent enough shape to to make the trek. Things that's went sideways, and I was not. Yeah, that's on you. It is on. I I I hand up. It is on me. But I would mm-hmm. not consider it a ditch. I would say it was a misfire. It was careless. It was careless. It's fair. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) Full accountability from Pete. Thank you. Which I appreciate. Which I appreciate. Uh, Winter weekend. Actually, you know what? Before we get into winter weekend, I will say this about winter weekend, though. Uh, I'm apparently a, a part of it. Yeah. I I say four years too late when when we used to go to fucking winter weekend and walk around like the goddamn Beatles. Yeah, we were like, no one's gonna give a shit now. Yeah, like they they didn't want anything to do with us back then. This year, I and and Tyler, you know, try and keep it in your pants here. But the go. segment that I will be uh, kind of like co emceeing, Sam Kennedy. I'm Bloom. Oh, come on. Alex Cora. On stage, in front of the millions and millions of screaming <clears throat> uh, Red Sox fans at, at Red Sox Winter Weekend. Uh, this weekend, Springfield. Um, I'll be there. So yeah, I'm so yeah. I'm so mad that I'm not gonna be available, so I can't be in like the crowd and be like, yeah, I got a question. <laughs> what the fuck is up with a ketchup? <laughs> I'll ask them for you, please, please. So I have the power to do that, Jared. Will, power to do that. Will you be at, like just pointing to people in the crowd for questions, or will you actually be delivering questions yourself? Mm-hmm. And has anyone ha- ruled anything out? Has anyone said, "Hey, Jared, you can't say this. Don't bring up Xander. We don't want to talk about." So, that. I'll, I'll give you a little behind the scenes here. I was told they want the hard hitting questions. Wow. Okay. Whoa. Yeah. So I will be asking questions. TC will be asking questions. But I was told they don't want they don't want softballs. They because they want like I'm sure because once they uh they they also turn the the microphones over to the fans that are in attendance to ask questions so they know. They know that the the hard like the hard hitting questions are coming if you're literally turning the microphone over to the fans. So uh, they they want to be asked those questions, and so I, from what I understand, I don't think that anything is really off limits for me to ask them in that forum. Can't wait till you ask them if they like big fat boobies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who doesn't? I mean, come on. I love them. Do you have a question, Jared, in your mind? Like, have you been brainstorming or are you going to kind of just feel it out? I mean, I, I'm going to ask every question that I think fans want to hear answered. Like, I, I, the first question in, that I have is... Your mic's cutting out. Oh, no. Don't pout, Still- figure it out. Don't pout, figure it out. I didn't pout for a fucking second. Nobody can fucking hear you, Jared. Fix it. I, it's, it. We can hear you like a tiny bit. Yes. Yeah, don't pout, figure it out. Look at him. What about now? Yeah, right, oh. good. Is it perfect? Yeah, it's good, yeah. Not yeah, as fast as sure. I would have fixed it, but not bad. <clears throat> you never fix it. You fucking, you'll literally like Throw unplug your, your goddamn up. internet. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, I don't know. I don't know, guys. Oh, oh. Fuck you guys. Continue with exit your question. Out. Yeah. The question that I want to ask is, uh, is about the trade deadline last year. Ooh. Like, why? Why? What was the logic behind staying over the luxury tax? Why didn't you get under and, and seeing what that answer is? Um, so we'll see. I have a few. I have a few. I have a few uh, 
few sneaky fastballs that I want to throw. If if I'm if I'm allowed, if I'm allowed to ask, then then I'm, they're they're gonna get asked. So we'll see you I, there when a weekend. I think the luxury tax is definitely because that, in a lot of ways, set the tone for how this offseason went. And we know all the qualifying offer complications. I think that the spring training offer to Bogarts. Where were you coming from? What was the plan there? Uh, when you offered four years, ninety million, and you thought you were acting in good faith at that time, um, what else? What else would stand out that has remained? You know, are you going to question? I think the luxury tax thing goes into the qualifying offer in all these parts. Is it why you weren't able to close deals with certain guys this off season? Why do you think players are willing to go other directions instead of still coming here? Yeah, I mean, all that, all that's on the table. Like I, I feel like if if you're them. You probably want to answer those questions. If you have responses to those questions in particular, and you've just kind of been sitting around all off season and haven't been able to answer them, then yeah, this is this is the forum to do it. I'm also the next morning. I'm doing the uh, kids press conference. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. You kids I, like I, big I, fat boobies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm doing the kids press conference Saturday morning at like 10 a.m. It's like me. Chris Sale, uh, Nick Pavetta, uh, maybe Kike. I don't know, uh, but I know I know Sale and Pavetta are confirmed for that. Just two real peachy guys, <laughs> just <laughs> just going in there to talk to the kids. <clears throat> um, so yeah, it'll be fun. It's my first year actually working it, and I would be lying if I said that I didn't wish that it was the whole Section 10 universe being involved in some capacity. Uh, But I'll make the most of it. I'm excited. I'm happy that they are involving me. And uh, the next episode, I will hopefully have some stories to tell. We'll see. We'll see. We're having some problems over here. What are you doing, Tyler? Are you pouting? I'm not pouting. I'm figuring it out. How are you? How, what problems do you have? Because I can hear you and see you perfectly. What problems do you have? I can't see you guys. My monitor shut off. You can't see us, but we can see and hear you. I believe I'll so. I'll be honest. This has happened to me in the past. Thank and you. you What you did what, Peter? You probably figured it out? Yeah, I didn't say anything. And then I just, yeah. and then I just restarted my computer and then rejoined. Right. <laughs> you didn't say for a single second that you pouted. Um, while Tyler's figuring it out. I'm trying to figure out how I can get some more blue moons. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you in just a little bit because trades, free agency, roster cuts, baseball season feels so far away, but excitement is already building. Blue moon gives you a dose of ballpark nostalgia without even being at the park. In fact, blue moon was born in a ballpark at the Sandlot Brewery in Denver, Colorado. It's bold flavor, bright explosion of color, and an iconic orange slice ritual guarantees a one of a kind beer experience year round uh pete i know that you don't like wrestling but do you want to come over my house for my royal rumble party and drink some blue moons with me i i don't dislike wrestling i'm just like i don't i don't go out my out of my way to do it i will if if an invite's extended to me so yes when is it uh the 28th i'm gonna be here so yeah i'm down yeah (laughs) all right yeah i mean like you don't even have to like wrestling to enjoy the Royal Rumble. Like there's just, it's chaos every 10 seconds or no. What is it? Every 30 seconds they count down and 10, nine, you never know who's going to come out. You never know who's going to win. You throw the wrestlers over the top. And then a lot of people like, we'll do like uh, a pool. So it's like, however many people are here, you can buy in and then you get like three numbers. And then if your number wins the Royal Rumble, then, then you take the pot. It's a good time. I'm absolutely down for that. I like being around, around people that care about things. Yeah, a lot of the people that are going to be here are very into wrestling, okay, including myself. Yeah. Uh, Jake and Tyler, you guys you guys can come too. I mean, I know that... Uh, well, not if you say it like that. Well, I mean, the last time that I fucking invited you guys to hang out with me, you were like, oh, I can't. I have to... I can't hang out. I've asked you to hang out before, Tyler. Yes or no? You have. And we have. Okay. We, we have no. hung out. Nope. Nope. When yes. have we ever hung out? Nope. When have we hung out? Uh, well, it is off camera considered hanging out or can it be on camera? 
What the we fuck kind of question? What is are that? you talking about, Tyler? <laughs> we did the live stream together. That that was a version of hanging no, out. No, no, no. You came over for a live stream. That doesn't count. You went to the watch party. That doesn't count. There was only one other opportunity, and I'm pretty sure we all had legit reasons. I think I think the watch party counts. The watch party should count. Pete, Pete's making a good point. It's a, it's a social function. Yeah, but it's podcast related. Yeah, but it's still a social function. No, nah, I don't count it. I don't count it. Is this your way of saying you want to spend time with me, Jared? I'd love to. We can bond. If, I, I, mean, I just, I don't know. I've most, most times I've had a one strike policy. Wow. Like if I'm just like, if I'm just like, hey, do you want to hang out? And then you say no. I'm like, all right, we'll fuck you forever. Then. Wow. Okay. So that I'm, I'm willing to give you a second chance. Are you asking for a second chance? I just want a second chance. That's it. All right. I, I want to be valued. Right. Okay. You, you are valued. You are valued. It's just. I'd also like to hang out with Tyler because I've never hung out with Tyler. It's true. Well, you could have if you didn't go on a downward spiral of drug use and <laughs> not show up to the party. I mean, it's it's equally both our faults because Tyler skipped the uh, the whatever the lucky strike night. I'll own that one. Was lucky, what was the lucky strike? Oh yeah, yeah, the night the Pat was yeah, there. Yeah, right. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. So uh, do I have two strikes? No, no, it's just, just it's just a one and one for me and you. Okay. Yeah. The thing is, too, if Pete did show up to the watch party presented by Blue Moon, by the way, uh, Pete did show up to that watch party. Uh, Pete would have met Tyler, but I don't think that Tyler would have met Pete. Listen, I made a lot of friends yeah. that night that I really do value <laughs> yeah. and care about. Yeah. <clears throat> Tyler would have met a version of me, and I would have and I would have remembered Tyler, but Tyler yeah. definitely w- wouldn't have remembered me. Right. Tyler really enjoyed himself some Blue Moons that evening. From its refreshing flavor with Valencia orange peel for a subtle sweetness and hints of coriander, Blue Moon Belgian-style wheat ale is a -a one-of-a-kind beer that's made brighter. It's carefully crafted and full-flavored with refreshing notes and a smooth, creamy finish. Why strike out with the same old beer when you can get something that's one-of-a-kind? Best served with a signature orange garnish to showcase its beautiful hazy color. A beer this good only comes around once in a blue moon, but you can enjoy it all off-season long. Make winter weather feel like spring training. Blue Moon Belgian style wheat ale is one of a kind every time. Get Blue Moon delivered by visiting get.bluemoonbeer.com slash rocket to see your delivery options. That is get.bluemoonbeer.com slash rocket. Blue Moon made brighter. Celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. Uh, I know the answer is probably going to be no from Tyler, but Pete, I'm just going to throw this out. Just going to throw this out. Just going to throw this out. Uh, for baseball is dead. I think we're doing a week in Arizona, but for like a pro on Nesson, I think we're also doing a week in Fort Myers, not traveling around the state of Florida, which I hate. I think we're just doing a week in, in Fort Myers. You should come. When is it? I don't know. Sometime during spring training. Uh, yeah. Circle back. It depends on uh, the hockey schedule. Do you have to actually be there or no? What do you mean? Like, you don't have to, like, go to games and shit, right? No. It, well, I mean, it depends on if I'm getting sent anywhere for, for work. So like, right. I'm just starting to travel more. So uh, I, mm. if I have something that conflicts, if not, I'm down. Mm-hmm. All right. That'd be cool. I've never been to spring training. It's been on, on my list. That, yeah. I was going to say that's surprising, but I guess that's not really that surprising. No. I've only been three times. I never went as a fan. Like I was, anytime I went, it was for work. I've never been. I'm also part of the uh, no Fort Myers squad. It is a little tougher on my end. I know you mm-hmm. assumed I'd say no, Jared. But since football season is well, coming to an end, you're like recently full time, so you can't just be like, "All right, guys, thanks, thanks for the new deal. See you later. I'm going to fucking Fort Myers." But you can't do. It. But if you can turn no, it into something wrong. for the station, like there, there might be something that could get worked out there. No, yeah. that is a that's a conversation piece. I wonder, I won't lie, so I've been, I, true, I've been trying to get some time off now that we're into the new year, because, you know, I didn't have time off around Christmas, I worked through, because uh, I was still part-time then. I've been looking to get two days off, and I've been getting yelled at a lot about asking for the two days off, so maybe shooting for five is asking for a lot, but who knows? I told them I need a break before or right after football season, because baseball season is go time for me. May not be go time for Zolak and Bertrand, but it's go time for Tyler Milligan. <laughs> it's go time for the Carabas e- Even if you come down for like a weekend. 
Yes, be I there think for the that whole week. would. Yeah, that would be a lot more realistic, I think. But mm. I've never done spring training, and it's on my list. I've always wanted to do it, and this seems like the right way to go about it. You got to do it. You deserve to do it. I'm one of those people that sits and watches like the videos of the players just walking back and forth between the clubhouse to hear the cleats on the dirt. Mm -hmm. If I was there in person, I'd feel things. Mm -hmm. Me too. I love that sound. A little click clack on the concrete. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) sorry. (laughs) Yeah, no, I like that sound too. Actually, you know what? What's your favorite baseball sound? Because there's a lot of really good baseball sounds. Like I like the sounds of like the metal spikes and the concrete, the crack of the bat, the smack of the mitt, uh, the crowd. There's there's a there's a lot of good like the even uh I don't know that until you I, I think you would really only hear it in real life, but if you're standing in the batter's box with someone that throws absolute fuzz, the sound that a fastball makes when it's cutting through the air and then when it hits the mitt like it's it's like like you can hear it and then the pop of the catcher's mitt it's terrifying so it's it's like it's actually terrifying that's that's essentially what i was gonna say but with a different spin like if if you watch a bullpen session if you're in like the first row by the bullpen you can kind of hear that yeah like the bullpen session is like my favorite sound in baseball the because you like listening to the whip of the ball and then the pop of the mitt fucking crazy it's, it's very scary it's the best like I- i'll say this right now to this day the the most fear that i can still ever really feel like i've been in like car accidents like uh, like i've had some like scary shit happen in my life the most fear that my body has been capable of feeling is like standing in in the batter's box, knowing that a guy is throwing like in the nineties and hearing it. Cause the combination, maybe if like, if the sound of the catcher's mitt wasn't so loud and aggressive, then maybe it wouldn't be as bad, but a fastball hissing at you and then exploding in the catcher's mitt is just a, a sequence of sounds that just, it terrifies me. Mine's a little different, and it might be cheating. It's technically crack of the bat, but I'm not going to go the crack of a wooden bat. I'm going to go the crack or like the ping of a metal bat. When you like truly square up a baseball, I think back to that video of whatever 13 year old Blaze Jordan hitting those 500 foot bombs. Those pings, murdering baseballs. It's different There's level. A, to me. Marcus Stroman's little brother posted a video in September of him at jet blue park and he absolutely like where the where the camera is it's like in the dirt mm-hmm. here Holy and shit. he just absolutely loses a baseball and this is probably the sound that you're talking about oh. just squaring one up i mean that like that's essentially Bryce a Harper swing. Videos. that's a good comp it's like the Bryce Harper swings. Uh, Blaze Jordan's done a ton of them over the years. Oh, yeah. Like he'll he have companies. This. It's a good sound. Yeah. Like that's why I like. That's why I like big golf events. Like when you hear that sound, basically followed immediately by the crowd. Like because it's it's different in baseball because you're not totally anticipating like a like a fucking ball getting destroyed every time. But when you're in a tee box for a golf event, like they're just waiting to explode as soon as they hear that sound. And it's the best. I will say, like, I remember back in 2015, like being in high school and it was when, you know, the lead up to Andrew Benintendi getting drafted was happening. He had all those homers his last year at Arkansas. You ever want to hear that ping over and over and over again? That's the video you go and see. Top. I know a lot of people listening are going to be like, that's wrong. And fuck you for saying that. Wow. People, people like, ba- they, they are. I, I'm not one of those people. I mean, I, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have that sound in my top three. Um, I, I like the sound because I've never played in like a wood bat league. Like every time that I played organized baseball, it was always metal bat. And anytime that I go back and like, um, like DraftKings 
had a company day at Fenway where everyone could go take batting practice, no shit, I'm using a fucking metal bat. Like yeah. I'm trying to, I, I'm not, I'm not like trying to make the team. I'm trying to hit a ball onto fucking Lansdowne Street. So I was using a metal bat. That's the sound that I'm used to when I hit a baseball. Uh, when I play in like those like charity games, I face Dallas, and everyone is getting on me for using a metal bat. I'm like, I, I'm trying to hit a home run off Dallas. I don't give a fuck. Uh, if you think, oh, wow, he really muscled one over the shortstop's head. Like, no, I'm trying to put this ball through the goddamn scoreboard. Uh, and I can't do that unless I have aluminum. But I don't, I don't, I wouldn't put it in my top three sounds. Also, the, just but, like if you hit the sweet spot on an aluminum bat, like it feels like nothing. It feels like absolute nothing. And that is so great. If you hit the sweet spot on a, on a wood bat, it's still, you still feel like that impact. And, it's not quite the same, obviously, but uh, just like swinging through and feeling absolutely nothing and watching it go is the best. It's like that feeling when you'd be at like those, you know, you play baseball growing up, you're at those tournaments during the summer and you hear one like that jacked ass 12 or 13 year old kid just annihilate a baseball in <laughs> everyone in the complex turns and looks. That's what my mind goes to immediately. I still prefer the wood bat, the sound, yeah, just the like I, the, the the sound of the bat, I think is more satisfying. But I understand what you're saying. You crack like a wooden bat, true crack, like perfect Mike Trout bomb 480. I don't think anything's going to match that. But that ping, I don't know if it's the childhood part or whatever. That is. It always sticks out to me. That's how like baseball was probably introduced to you, like playing T-ball and playing in Little League. Like it's the ping. But if you never get past the ping, then you don't get the bling. Bar. Crazy. Say it again. It's not true. You can still get bling with a metal bat in college world series. Yeah, those yeah, they're fucking loaded, dude. The college players. That You're is, a fucking is, idiot. There's a difference that. between bling and money. You're an idiot. You can get a you can get a college world series ring. <sighs> it's obviously not what I'm talking about, Pete. It's hard it's, it's not, hard to know. It's not hard to not know. What, Jake, can, what was I talk what was I talking about? Was I talking about championship rings when I said that? You could have been. That's what I no. interpreted it as. <laughs> no. <laughs> God damn was... it, Jake. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you don't get those uh, it's $300 so million devastating contracts. When, when Jake chimes in and refutes your point because he never speaks. So it's like, what am I going to fucking argue? He saves, that, he saves his bullets for when he, when he thinks that it matters most. So what am I going to fucking push back? God damn it, Jake. Fuck you. <laughs> CP, you're best. crying. This happens to you once. This is like happens to me two or three times during a podcast. Yeah, you're That's terrible takes. True. That's <laughs> not true, off. Tyler. It's very true. That's and not don't true. Don't ask Jake if it's true or not. Jake, is that true? No, not at all. <laughs> yeah, see? You're an idiot, Tyler. <laughs> Fuck. You're an idiot. <laughs> there's just no, there's no defending that. Um, anyways, so I guess you could you call this an, an eventful time in between episodes yeah yeah i'd say it's it's eventful enough i still don't think that we're done and, and I, I feel like that's not like an unpopular that's not a hot take uh the red sox are not done but i like where we're going i like where we're going and now like it is cr I, i'm just gonna stop reading the internet because i can't there's just too many dumb fucking people out there but i went from you're a negative Nancy Felger wannabe like you're always down on everything to now now that th things are happening and I'm seeing kind of like what the direction is we're still like there there's not one singular move that the Red Sox can make right now where we're going to pivot to oh man this is like a this is a World Series contender but I think if there's some sort of uh take that I have where people might call me crazy it is that uh if the red sox make a couple more moves here and by a couple more moves i mean in addition to what they just did by signing adam duvall if they sign an elvis andrews or even a jose iglesias you can play with that combo of like shortstop second base center field with kike uh christian arroyo uh, Elvis Andrews, if it's him, Jose Iglesias, if it's him, um, you can play with that combo depending on who they would bring in. And then you still, you still haven't made a trade. Like you still have not used any of your bullets on a trade piece. 
Whether and and I said, you know, people are, oh, what if you trade for you know this guy, that guy, this guy? It, I want a starting pitcher, and there there are some out there. Obviously, it's at a it's it's very much at a premium. So I you know I've thrown names out there. Uh, I know that like you know Shane Bieber is a guy that the Guardians are not necessarily interested in trading, but you know the 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 Athletic said that about Josh Donaldson, and then you know a few days later they fucking trade the guy. So. I want to see where it goes, but we are knocking on the door of this team could maybe if, if all things go right, which last year, a lot of things went wrong, but if all things go right, like everyone wants to draw comparisons to the 2013 team, this team is not the 2013 Boston Red Sox. They're just not like there, there were still some core franchise players there. Like uh, David Ortiz was was on that team. Dustin Pedroia was on that team. John Lester was on that team. Uh, and then you added in a lot of really, uh, you you I guess you in a way lucked out with Koji Uehara giving you one of the best relief seasons of any reliever in baseball history. Like I don't love the 2013 comparisons, but what i do see here and what i think we could be knocking on the door of is if all things go well if the red sox somehow make a couple more moves and can get to like 85ish win- how many wins did they have last year 78 78 if they can improve just a little fucking bit if they can knock on the door of maybe 85 wins and maybe get the 6 seed we saw with the Phillies, who are a far better team. <laughs> the Phillies, are, like the Phillies, are a far for for what they were as a six seed. The Phillies are a much better team. Like the the Red Sox don't have a Bryce Harper. They don't have a fucking Zach Wheeler uh, and a JT Real Muto. Like the Phillies are a far more talented team than the Boston Red Sox. All I'm saying is that sometimes all it takes is getting in and getting hot at the right time, and crazier things have happened. I'm not. I'm not trying to. Not trying to juice up World Series aspirations with what this team is from a roster perspective. And and I say this with all sincerity. Maybe this is pathetic. Maybe it's not. 2023, all I want is a team that's watchable. I, I'm not I'm not World Series or bust. I'm not you gotta make the playoffs or this the season is a failure. I just don't want to feel like the season is over by Mother's Day. I don't want to be, you know getting to mid June being like let me check out the Stanley Cup finals like i don't i don't want to do that no one wants to do that no one wants to watch hockey what the fuck and unless the bruins are there, unless the bruins are there still right? what the fuck <laughs> he's spitting i mean right if now. It, 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 i'm spitting bars right now just chill chill my dog uh would it be better if i said the nba final th- those are like the same time the nba finals no one wants to watch like the fucking yeah, milwaukee bucks Cole, and he's the not here. detroit he can say pistons that. Yeah, sure. I just want a baseball team to watch. I just want something to where I can sit down on a Tuesday night, turn on Nesson, and, and and not want to to kill myself. Is that too much to ask? No. Is that too much to ask? It's not too much to ask at all. And I think especially coming off a year in 2022 where everyone was miserable 24-7, like I think the 2023 Red Sox, it's going to be the all-vibes team. Like, I really believe that. You look in right field. You got Alex Verdugo. Absolute firecracker. Dude's going to have fun. He's going to do his part. We need to touch on his brother's tweet the other day, by the way, at some point during this podcast. Yes, I agree. I think is very important. You add Adam Duvall in center field. We're basically trying to run back the Hunter Renfro plan. That's what this is. A guy who hit 38 homers in 146 games in 2021, led the NL in RBIs with 113. Obviously, 2022, he wasn't right. Uh, Had the torn tendon sheath and his left wrist had to have surgery on it. But a guy who's meant to hit at Fenway Park, left field. Did anyone watch Yoshida's press conference? That dude's fucking adorable. Like the way he was having fun up there, (laughs) he's going to be a blast. No matter how you feel about the Red Sox, you're excited to see him. Devers is 12 and eating ice cream. Tristan Casas is first full season. The catching situation. Hey, Jorge Alfaro, if he makes the team over Connor Wong, dude's electric as a personality. Kike, the de facto leader, it seems. Justin Turner, one of the best clubhouse guys in baseball. Kenley, Jolie Rodriguez in the bullpen. It's nice. Uh, known as character guys. 
The rotation, Bayo, let's see if Chris Sale is as fired up as Chris Sale used to be. The vibe should be strong. Is it 2021 or 2013, like you said, Jared, where you have a legit core in place? Not really. You kind of got to figure that out. But as long as you can kind of twist your head at it, close one of your eyes and say, there's a way things go right and they win 84 games. And, you know, with two weeks left in the season, we're saying, hey, are they probably going to make the playoffs? No. But do they have a long shot chance at it? I think we'd all be thrilled here and see it as a step forward because you can't view this year through, oh, I want the Red Sox to win a championship. Like this is a championship year. And, you know, we all hope for that. The Red Sox aren't shooting for that this year. They're not going over the luxury tax. They don't view it in that light. Be mad at them for fucking that up. They had they lost a year or two because of how they handled the Bogart situation. But for what this year is, is it possible this team's going to be fun and have great vibes and it's going to be a different tone completely than 2022? It's going to be hard not to. I just want to have fun. I mean, I, I don't think that that's asking a lot, but I think the bar should be much higher. And the bar has been readjusted based on what hasn't been done, or I guess what has been done in some circumstances. But like, we shouldn't readjust our, we shouldn't fully readjust like our expect, expectation levels. You can be, you can say like, hey, I, I'm, I'll be happy that this team doesn't make me want to kill myself every night. But this team has to get back to being an elite baseball team in, in Major League Baseball because they have the resources to do so. They should be like a superpower in baseball. You need to get back to that soon. But I'm but like also saying, yes, I'm, I, I can be grateful that things are better than they were last year and we're taking a step in the right direction. But at the end of the day, I have a hard time just being like, OK, with having a complete like a, just a complete baseball team <laughs> like no, you're, you, Jared would say like the moves that they made pretty like starting to come together. Yeah, they made moves to like put together a full fucking lineup. Congratulations. That is the absolute <laughs> baseline of what you can expect from the mm-hmm. front office. I I I still have significant doubts that this team is going to be much better than they were last year. Over under 78 wins. I'll go first. Over. I would say I would say over. But I don't think it's a lock, mm-hmm. and I don't think it's going to be much better. No. They need a strong start to the season. Didn't if this we team craters the first month? R.I.P. Didn't we hear that they like that they were going to be much better a few months ago? Wasn't that like the the promise? Is it, it significantly? What was it? What was the adjective? Oh boy, Tyler. Uh oh. <laughs> oh boy, Tyler. I thought that the- <laughs> he is. Oh man, this is outrageous. Uh. Anyways, what were you saying, Pete? I thought that the adjective was much better. I could be wrong. <laughs> thought that that's what it was. Um, I don't remember. Jake, do you remember what the adjective was? I think that was when we extended Kike and Bloom promised him to. But like, what did he say much better? He did say much better. I think it might have been much better. Hello? I think so. Hello? Yeah, there yeah. we go. Kike Hernandez was told by Hein Bloom they were going to be much better in 2023. That was the line when he signed the extension. I don't think that's true. I, I 100%. But I think the reality is, and hold the Red Sox accountable. When they fucked up Xander Bogarts, they completely changed their plan. They legit said, we are going to take a step back here. They went away. They didn't go and try to hand out a bunch of money to anyone else. They were never super deep in talks. They pulled Nate of all these offer off the table. Yeah, but Nate we don't have to give him credit for that. We don't no, have to like, we don't have nobody's to. Giving, like, cr- nobody's giving credit to the Red Sox for that. But realistically, like what their plan is, it changed. And like, it sucks. You shouldn't be here. You should be competing for a World Series this year. That's the thing. But at least they've picked a direction. Like the direction moving forward is, yeah, we are going to take this as a bridge year in 2023. You shouldn't be here. No. But at the end of the day, if this is what their objective is now, we're playing a different game than what you were hoping to play at the beginning of the offseason. That's a failure on the front office in terms of Xander Bogarts. You got to hold them on that, but you got to look through the lens of what they're trying to do. It doesn't change the grade on the offseason. Like it's not going to be a great offseason no matter what way you put it. Right. But I I just don't want to like I don't want to like change that window, you know, where it's like. Okay, well, okay, this is coming together. Yeah. And they're doing like they're doing this, blah blah. blah. It's like okay, but if you went, if you if you advance the window like a couple more months, they they failed. Like, and we have to get over it at some point. 
And I, I, that's why I understand like Jared being like, okay, I just want to watch a watchable baseball team. You have to get over the fact that Xander's gone, but like my, I think the expectation it, it, that shift, I still have a hard time grasping it. And like, I think that's so fair. And that's Pete. I agree with you. Like, I felt like I've seen a lot on Red Sox Twitter, like the grades for the offseason are creeping up, like up, up pretty quickly. I felt like I've seen the last week and it's like, no, like you have to look at it from the lens of what they were trying to do when the season ended. If everything went right for the Red Sox this offseason, Xander Bogarts would be here. Nate Evaldi would be here and they would have gone over the luxury tax and probably spent money somewhere else. That's that's the reality. They took Nate's deal off the table when they missed out on Xander. They said, we are not going to go and pay a veteran. We're not going to push over because we don't think we are in that range of a championship team anymore. That like that's a failure based on what your goals were. Will I give them some credit? I'm not giving them a ton of credit, but for changing plans and at least making the proper steps for that plan to make sense. Sure. But no matter what, when you watch this team this year, you're going to be sitting there in the back of your head saying, I know what this year was actually supposed to be. I'm happy they're building towards something now. It's better than where we were a month and a half ago where we were like, they're building to fucking nowhere. Like this team is yeah, lost right. with no clue. At least they picked a road. It and, still it still feels like even though the lineup is kind of coming together and the team is coming together, it still feels like if if a few things go wrong, this is going to be a fucking mess it, and we're going to be kind of back in the same place. That's it. And we have to sit here and we're being optimistic. We're hoping... Chris Sale can give you 100 innings, 120 innings. We're hoping James Paxson can give you 100 innings. Garrett Whitlock can give you something close to a full season workload. You know, he's going to have an innings limit. We're hoping Brian Bayo can hold his own in his first full major league season, which I'm hoping for. But what happens if he goes out there and it's just an awful sophomore slump campaign? Like you and see how it can kind of fall in on you very quick with injury. And I mean, even even with like the recent signings, it's like, Duvall, it's like you're hoping that he plays an, an entire season in center field when he c- couldn't play. He didn't do a full season last year. You, Justin Turner, he's what, 38? Yeah. 37, 38. You're 38. hoping for a full season from him. Like Duvall's 34. <laughs> like you're you're making you're making a lot of uh, like best case scenario assumptions where the percentage is there may not be as high as you want them to be. And that's where I think some of that 2013 and 21 comps a little bit like you need like a majority of things to go right like they did Mm -hmm. that year. I think we're all sitting here and saying everything went wrong last year. That doesn't mean it's going to go right this year, but you hope the pendulum kind of swings in the opposite direction. They need everything to go right. (laughs) Yeah, if they're going to win 85 games, almost everything has to go right. Yoshida needs to be a beast like like Brian Bayo is going to have to essentially be a, a frontline guy. Like Chris Sale is probably like best case scenario. Chris Sale, what? 130 innings? Best case. Best case. And we heard from Brian O'Halloran this week. They are not planning on a six man rotation. So that's pitching every five days. Best case scenario, 130 innings for Chris Sale. Uh, Bayo, he's got to be on some sort of innings limit, like best case for him, 170 innings. Last year was the first time he had ever gone over 150 innings in a professional baseball season. Before that, it was 118. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, 165, 170 for him. Uh, I mean, listen, Andrew Kashner is not walking through that door. <laughs> like we're just not going to have an absolute stud innings eater up in here that's that's kind of what like I, I in a weird way was sad when johnny cueto signed with um the marlins i was like just give me a guy that can take the fucking ball i don't care it's like all right you get johnny cueto in here and he's got a four and a half era give me a guy that's gonna like sniff a buck 80 uh 190 something like that that'd be great what is what is johnny Cue- I mean, i'm pulling that out of my ass because i know that he used to like crush 200 innings for breakfast but what's he been recently? I don't even know. Well, not last that, year, that low key Johnny Cueto was insanely good for no reason last year. 335 <laughs> year. Oh, brother. Jesus Christ. <laughs> how, how many innings, you fuck? One. My, my 130. 130? One 135? 135? That's, 
I mean, that's not good. That's not <laughs> what we need. I mean, it's fine. I mean, he'd be an ace on the Red Sox, but I, I, want, innings, I mean, like, though. I want them to feed Chris Sale steroids. Like, I want Chris Sale to show up to spring training looking like a fucking moose. And I don't care that if he gets, I don't care if he gets popped. I'd rather see him get popped for PEDs and get suspended for like 50, 60 games than to hear about Chris Sale hitting his, hitting his leg on a coffee table and having to miss like fucking four months. I would rather him miss <laughs> trying to stay healthy, trying to be more than like 130 pounds and pitch every five days than see him have a fucking horrible injury and be gone for four months again. I hate that I laughed at that, but I think I laughed because it, that's plausible. Like he, in theory, could hit his knee on a coffee table and like break his kneecap. Yeah. Like that would be it. That would be it. Like crazier things have happened with Chris Sale. I, I I'm a big Chris Sale guy. I I want to see him do well. I hope that I hope he's the comeback player of the year this year. I know a lot of fans have already been like, eh. Like he's not going to give you anything, and I think that that has to be the mentality if you're an executive. the 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 mentality if you're an executive has to be, um, we're building this rotation as though he's not even going to be a part of it. But um, unfortunately, they're they've built this rotation as if he's like the number two. It, and so. that's the one of the things. Like going back to what Pete was saying earlier, they said they wanted to get a guy at the top of the rotation that would push everyone down and not put them in those spots. You didn't do that. And I don't think you're going to get that. Like, I know you mentioned Shane Bieber earlier, Jared. Like, they're not going to trade one of their top prospects for him at this point. Like, if they're going to trade for someone, it will be someone like Edward Cabrera or Jesus Lazardo that will be, you know, still here and maybe ascending when, you know, the next big Red Sox team comes together. 2025, maybe 2024, they take some more steps towards it. But, like, those are the guys they're looking at. And I think the scary thing is, like, you're mentioning someone like Johnny Cueto, maybe someone you could kind of lean on. Well, the innings eater guy they went after was Corey Kluber, who it's great that he was healthy last year. Would anyone be shocked if things went wrong this year and he got hurt like he did the last couple seasons? No. Like, this is a guy whose velocity was dropping over the course of last season as well. Like, there's a lot, there's a lot up in the air. But if you look at Chris Sale, you hope, what, John Lackey? You hope he comes back and looks like John Lackey in 2013? You may not be dominant, but give me very good. Give me three, five. Just like remind me that he's on the team. <laughs> like at this point, that's that's a that's a found money is to just have Chris sale there. That and hoping that Bayo and Whitlock, like you need a couple of these arms. If they can take a step, sure, you're there. The talent is there. It's just there's so much risk. There's so much risk across this entire roster. And I feel like every time we get a notification over the next, you know, what, call it seven, eight, nine months, we're going to flinch. Like anytime yeah, you, you see. Not being, you're not being very positive right now. I think. See, this is what we lose when we don't have positive <sighs> Paul. <laughs> Fuck. Too soon. I'm just saying positive Paul wouldn't be talking like this. Okay. Do you want something positive? Yeah. Hold on. I close out my Google Doc. I, I tried to give a whole goddamn speech about how I, I was positive about where the Red Sox are at, and here comes fucking Milliken just pissing all over. No, it. I listen. I bro, I was talking all vibes. I think the vibes are good. I like Adam Duvall. The vibes are going to be great. They are going to be great. Like in your that's that's the telltale sign is when your team acquires a player, and then the fan base of the team that that player just came from. Is like take care of our boy, like we fucking love. They're, they're devastated that he's gone. Take care of our guy. That happened with Kike, and it's happening with Adam Duvall. Braves fans all are like very, very sad that he's leaving. Um, I feel like it happens with a lot of Dodgers guys. It happened with Verdugo. Happened with Kike. Uh, a little bit with Turner, but I feel like they were probably just like ready to move on. I mean, he had been there forever, and he's thirty-eight goddamn years old. Um, I, I throw Kenley in that as well. Obviously, coming from Atlanta this past year, but all those Dodgers guys, like I did not get that. For, uh, Braves fans were like, "Take them, like good luck." I, I and, think you know, personally, I think on the field there was a little bit of that, but it seems like as a clubhouse guy, everyone was like, "Yeah, he's such a fucking fantastic dude." I'm telling you right now, 
this 2023 Boston Red Sox team, if they suck, we're still going to like them. <laughs> I, I feel like I've at least arrived on that where there have been some Red Sox teams that have sucked and I'm like, fuck these guys. The, 2020, the 2012 Boston Red Sox, fuck that team. Fuck them. The 2015 Red Sox, fuck them. That, those two teams, I could not stand. Either one of the 2012, 2015, two of the worst years of my life. And it was because the Red Sox were so bad and the team was so unlikable. But this team, 23, they could suck. And I could be like, you know what? I still, I still fucks with these guys. 2014, last place team. Like that team. That was a good team. A lot of, good, a lot of uh, uh, holdovers from 20. They eventually traded the entire rotation. Uh, but 2014, that was like, you know, oh, JBJ's here. Mookie's here. Xander's here. Like, this is cool. Like, we can at least see the future. They may suck, but they're not going to suck for very long. And we were right. They ended up winning a World Series a few years later. Uh, 2023, I don't think it's going to be the same where it's like, oh, I can see some of these guys are going to be here for, for a title. Mikasas, Bayo, guys like that. Uh, I don't think we're going to see Meyer this year. The people that no. are like, like Marcelo Meyer, get, like, get his ass up here in September, get his feet wet if we're out of it. Dude fucking has never played above a ball. Like, pump the brakes. Uh, I got develop. I think if you're hoping when you're going to see Marcelo Meyer, it's probably the end of next season. Like end of 2024. Maybe he has an amazing year. He won't. Best case scenario, he gets maybe a week in AAA at the end of the season. Best case. And we know Heim. He's told everyone. AAA is very important to him. He's not no Dave Dombrowski skipping Benintendi to the majors or Devers after nine games in AAA. You're not going to get that with him. But I don't know. I felt like a lot of people when I was looking at the Duval talk on the timeline, people were either on one side, Hunter Renfro 2.0. And then the other side was, this guy fucking sucks. I just looked at his numbers from last year. He played 86 games. Dude hit 12 fucking homers. Uh, you know, whatever. He's fat and he plays center field. Like, like, that was a majority of it. And it's like, he's good in center field. He may be a little bigger. I don't think he's fat. I think he's athletic. But like, we're talking a guy who's 88th percentile outs above average. And this is last season. He was in center field the majority of the time last year for the first time. And when he hurt his wrist, it wasn't in center field. He got hurt playing left field. And if you look up the highlight, it's like ridiculously kind of stupid. Like he chased the foul ball and like just put his wrist up like this against the wall. Like if I was trying to feel on Jared's chest, like that's what it looked like on the wall. You know what I'm saying? And even before he got hurt. So first two months of last year, he was horrendous. April and May, 48 weighted runs created plus. From June 1st through the end of the season, which was mid-July for him after he got hurt. Dude had an 891 OPS, hit 10 of his 12 home runs, and had a 143 weighted runs created plus. 43% above league average. So he can hit. He was cold. He made a swing adjustment, and he, he mashed until he got hurt. So that guy from 2021 is still there. If you get half of that, you're thrilled. Like, it's a huge win. Yeah, but it, it's like, it goes back to like, th there's so many question marks. There's it's not just him. There's so <laughs> many question marks with this entire Pete, team. Just go with it. Pete, just go. with No, it. I know. But it's 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 like a team could it, do it. But like, that's that's the thing. It's like when you talk about what does this team project to be like over under 78 wins? Like, how the fuck do has anybody know? Because there's right, so, then, so many things that could go look, in different directions. Let's break it down. OK, let's break it down. We were talking about the, the lineup, mm -hmm. right? OK, so MLB Network put this out. Emily Network put this out. Potential 2023 starting lineup for the Boston Red Sox. Uh, leading off in left field, Masataka Yoshida. I feel like that is a very a lock. universally accepted thing because he's, you know, the bat to ball skill, the on base skill, uh, the strike zone awareness. That's a no brainer that Yoshida is your leadoff hitter. Just Jared, makes too much extremely sense. excited about that one. That's like one of the few things that I'm very excited about when it comes to the Red Sox. I'm excited to find mm -hmm. out what. What this guy's got. But again, mm -hmm. big question mark. He's never played in the majors before. It, and mm -hmm. Jared, you saw the steamer projection. Now, I think it, it's aggressive on Yoshida. I, I do not think he's going to put was those aggressive. numbers up. But it's fun yeah, to it look at. Like, they have Yoshida having an 867 OPS, hitting 19 homers, being 40% above league average as a bat, and walking more than he strikes out, almost having a four war, 3.8. 
I could I mean, see him that, being that's my favorite thing. player on this team other than Devers. Like, yeah, I could see this guy being like one of my favorite players. Definitely. He's got to have a thing. Like he, he's got like he's got to have like a like whenever he like gets a base hit, like he has like his own celebration. You they see gotta, the dumbbells? They got to play like the Yoshi sound. Oh, dumbbells? Yes. Wow. Like he's just got to like eat pussy. Like <laughs> like you know how like you know how Yoshi has like the tongue thing? Like he's got to go to first base and be like, blah. <laughs> All right. He's got to. Do- this is a sexual team. Kike and Hernandez then they do and Justin bat. Turner I- have sex. Dude, it doesn't matter yeah. how many wins they have. If they're the horniest team in baseball, I'm going to love them. Yeah. It's like if, if, if Yoshida goes to first base <laughs> and like you've got Kike on the top step of the dugout, just being like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> like that'd be sick. That team's winning the- 85 games. They got to keep the vibe strong. And listen. You know, they say that baseball has older fans. Like, it's not a lot of young people watching baseball. So it's kind of like rated R. Like, you should be allowed to do shit like that. It's like, how many kids are really paying attention? Apparently not a lot. Dude. Not a lot. Did We saw what Mookie was doing in L.A. last year. Yeah, he was, he was jerking off all over everybody. Fuck it. Coming we're on his off. own face. We're all going to jerk off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> Batting second <laughs> for the Boston Red Sox. Go. Uh, shortstop. You get you love him. You you knew he was gonna be the shortstop all along. Kike Hernandez, uh, batting second. I I like Kike hitting second there. He can't he can't be what he was last year. Uh, but I I like it's it's, it's almost like <clears throat> dress dress for the job that you want, right? Is that the phrase? Yeah. yeah. You bat Kike second. Maybe he, he hits like a number two hitter. I don't know that he stays there, but I like out of the shoot hitting Kike second. I'd prefer him lower in the lineup, but I think he eventually lands there. Because if you don't have Kike hitting second out of the shoot, who, who hits in that spot? You bump up Devers? Yeah, a lot of people would put Devers in what the about number Arroyo? two spot. It, it depends. I think they're going to put two in Arroyo. I think that's most likely going to be how they go about it. I think that there's still like this is a very like we're recording this on January 19th. So uh, what's his name? Fucking Hassan Kim. That's he's not he's not a Boston Red Sox yet. But when he is, then he's going to that changes the whole dynamic. We're going to have to do the lineup card all over again because that changes the entire dynamic of, of where guys are. That's the thing. It's the route. It's either. OK, now they've waited on Elvis Andrews. We know. So at this point, it's Kike at short. Do you trade for Joey Wendell to platoon with Arroyo? Do you pay Elvis Andrews, put him at short, and move Kike back to second? Or do you get Kim and you keep Kike at second and Arroyo in a bench roll? You've got options. You got but that would be that's a, it. You got options. If you would you rather trade for Kim or a starting pitcher? Ooh. I'd rather I, trade for Joey Wendell and Edward Cabrera. And so, mm. go play second base, uh, Joey. Go play with uh, uh, Christian. We'll give Christian some fair run here. Let Kike play shortstop. This is a move more geared towards the future. I think I, I like Hassan Kim, but it seems like you know it's going to be Tanner Houck for him. Uh, that that three plus. I kept hearing everyone bring that up. That has not come from a credentialed person. Like no, there has not been a legit source that has had that. Correct. Um, Correct. And I, I saw Lou retweet it, and it's nothing. No offense to him, but I think a lot of Red Sox Twitter picked it up. Even Hulk for Kim, I flinch a little bit. I can't lie, I flinch. How many years of control does Kim have? Uh two. And then there's like a weird option thing uh, that I was kind of diving into the other day. It's he has a one dollar option. <laughs> what? <laughs> hold Hell on, yeah. hold on. I'll, I'll read this to you. Uh, I was trying to get like a firm answer on it. Um, and I couldn't find one. Here we go. So in 2025, he has a mutual option worth $1, but his salary, it also says $1 and it's a 2 million buyout. Is that like a, is that like an AAV manipulator? He had a weird stipulation in his contract where, so technically he'd be like eligible for arbitra- arbitration in 2025, but it was a way to get out of that which is a thing when players come over internationally, depending on how many years you have in that league. Kim's obviously on the younger side. I think that option, I'm pretty sure it's two years. So I think it's two years of control for Kim. 2023 and 2024. I feel like 
to answer the original question, I feel like I'd rather find out what you have with pitching. Like I'd rather find, I'd rather use this year to find out like if somebody emerges and, and like just try to have like a lineup that, that hits <laughs> like, I think it's more likely you find out what you have pitching with pitching mm-hmm. than like in the system or with what you've got. It's just, I, I think if you have a chance, like you're in a good spot right now, right? Like you got the Whitlock, you got the Bayos of the world. And, and you know, you kind of hope those two guys take that step into the top of the rotation arms. I think if you can add an elite talent, it's a different conversation. Like Cabrera is someone who was one of the biggest prospects in the sport, you know, a year ago. If you can add something like that, that's a pretty big deal while staying in the middle. Because I, I think you look at some of those starter options you have at AAA. I don't buy Brian Mata as a starter. I think he's a reliever. I think Brandon Walter is probably the closest thing to a starter in that group. We'll see if his back holds up to allow him to do that. But then you're talking like Cutter Crawford, Josh Winkowski, you know, Seabold got sent to fucking Colorado. So good luck. Um, But I don't know. I think if you have a chance at that kind of upside and you could say, all right, we're going to have Cabrera, Bayo and Whitlock leading our next great team. Hopefully in 2025, like you have your own trio atop of the rotation arms. It's a good place to be living. Like that allows me to accept the bridge year more. That's like, that's them telling me, all right, this is the timeline. This is 14. Basically. I mean, I guess I can live with that if, if the, if they've identified the players that are actually going to be part of the next core and it's not like a, a showcase. Because we've already we've already heard Tristan Casas's name in, in trade rumors this off season. And That's like, bananas to me. I, I, he's not going anywhere. I, so Peter, I don't think he's going anywhere either. But his name has come up. I think the Red Sox will will they'll listen. I, I don't. I think it'd take like, hey, you want to trade Sandy? You can trade Sandy to us. Sure, sure. We can we can mention Tristan Casas. We can have that conversation. <laughs> Didn't but he just the, come yeah. up because like the Marlins were like, we we want him. Yeah, we, that's the guy. They want a major bat, even though Casas is young. You know, who knows what's going to happen this year? But that's what they're shooting I just, for. I just, I don't, I can't remember the last time that I believed in a prospect the way that I believe in Tristan Casas. And just to because like, how into, fucking big he is, and to abandon that after like half a season doesn't make any sense. Well, it's not abandoning it if you're raiding the Marlins of one of their elite starting pitchers. Like that's why. It, like I would, I would kind of compare it to. When the Red Sox traded Hanley Ramirez for Josh Beckett and Mike Lowell, it's like you're giving up a fucking surefire top prospect that's going to be somebody, but the guy that you're getting back is going to pitch his way to a World Series for you. And again, it's the same team. It's the Marlins. So uh, I'm not saying that I want to do that or that it would be the similar result because right now, like you're not. You have to remember too, like you're not in like a similar position to what the 07 Red Sox were, but the 06 Red Sox kind of sucked. They were they yeah. were a middle of the pack team. And the Red Sox last year, and I'm gonna fucking say this point one more time, just to hammer it. And I know that there's like fans I always forget that. There's fans of teams that are not Red Sox fans that listen to this podcast, which again, thank you guys. I'm not sure why, but like thank you guys for listening. Uh the Red Sox finished in last place last year, but they weren't a last place team. Like, don't get that confused. The Red Sox have finished in last place before. 15, they deserve to finish in last. 14, they deserved it. 12, they deserved it. Last year's team, they were very middle of the pack. They were they were a third place team. They weren't that great. They weren't that bad. Uh, they were in a very good division, but they weren't that bad. And that's kind of what the 06 Red Sox. They had last place vibes, though. <laughs> they definitely had last place <laughs> vibes, but that was, that was their own doing. Now, a lot of that was, you know, Xander Bogarts. Yeah. It, and I think like, like you said, it's like those years you had the seventh overall pick this year. You have the 14th, like you are truly right in the middle. And like, I think you're looking at like the rotation and everything here. Chris Hill. It's awesome. He has two more years here. It's this year and next year. Like he's not going to be part of the next great Red Sox team. That's reality. Nick Pavetta. Maybe Corey Kluber will be gone in a year. James Paxson's going to be gone in a year. So really, a year from now, what's the conversation we're having about what? How good does that look, by the way? 
What do you getting mean? Getting Paxson for four million bucks. And, and Scott Boris, like the only, arguably maybe the only L he took this offseason, besides the Carlos Correa stuff. Um, but that's the thing. It feels like there's a lot of pitching right now, but in a year when the rotation is Bayo, Whitlock, and Pavetta, and Sale, like, is what's Sale at that point? Who knows? Like, if you're building towards the future in terms of true knowing what a starter is, I don't think Tanner Houck is that. I, I do think he's more of a bullpen arm. You're hoping some of those guys in AAA click. And I don't, none of them are top 100 guys. None of those are Brian Bayo, who was ranked 24th the last time Baseball America did a ranking. Or yeah. Garrett Whitlock, who, we don't even know if he's a starter. Like, I'm the starter Garrett Whitlock guy. What he's if not. he's not a starter? He's not. He is. You're wrong. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you that he's not. But he is. It's okay. It's okay. It's uh, it's fine. The Whitlock army is. I'm feeling starting to gather behind. You're, it's just. It's really just you. No, we're strong. Shout out the Millican militia. <laughs> Batting third for your Boston Red Sox, Rafael Devers coming off a fucking 331 million dollar extension. And he'll be better because he won't be playing on one leg for half the year. Mm-hmm. Hopefully. Uh, we don't know that for sure. True. Yeah, that's true. Justin Turner, the 38-year-old designated hitter, batting cleanup. And then Alex Verdugo. And Tyler brought this up earlier. I have it pulled up right here uh, on Twitter. Was that yesterday or the day, the day before? Two days yesterday. ago. Two days ago. Uh, his brother Chris, who sometimes listens to the podcast. I don't know if he's listening right now. So up, I'll, I'll shout out Chris. Hey, Chris. Chris, Jared, I think I mentioned to the, this to you off the show, but Chris came mm-hmm. and told me this in like, I want to say August. And he was like, Verdugo had a broken toe the first two months of the year. Because he, the reason he told me was when we had that conversation about guys on the team playing through injury. That's why he DM'd we that had- to me. On Sports Hub or on, on this show? On this show, on the Kravis <laughs> pod. When we were sitting there and saying like, we were talking about Xander, I think at the time, and Rafi, who weren't healthy and playing through it. He was like, yeah, you guys were spot on talking about that. Because like, Verdugo didn't want to, you know, my brother, obviously Verdugo, did not want to come out of the lineup. Like, obviously he was super unlucky in April. In May, we had the conversation, go back and play it. We were like, something's not right with him. Like, he looks off. Yeah. After June 1st, like, the numbers were crazy. One of the hardest hit balls of the whole year was uh, the home run that Verdugo hit off of Biebs in Cleveland. Oh, I was at I was at a restaurant where it was like a family dinner. We were celebrating something, and uh, <laughs> the <clears throat> the game was on. Like if I'm like sitting at the table right here, like the table's going this way, and I'm sitting at the end of the table, the TV to my right above the bar was on with no sound and we're just probably i don't know 10 to 12 members of my family are sitting here having a nice things are not going well today even technically (laughs) oh there we go what jared we lost you for like the last five seconds oh sorry my mic this is this microphone sucks i need to get my studio set up no your video uh, is your video oh really yeah okay uh, so <clears throat> there's probably like 10 to 12 family members at this, at this table. And then the TV is to my right and there's no sound on this TV. So I'm looking, watching the Red Sox game and it was one of those swings where you don't need to hear the crowd. You don't need to hear the crack of the bat. I just fucking knew it was gone from the second that he swung and I stood up and started screaming in this restaurant. Uh, that because at the time that was a we we still had a shot <laughs> we still had a shot because the in, the excuse me the Guardians the Guardians were I mean they ended up winning the division right yeah yep they they were a measuring stick back then like that was considered oh we we got a stretch against a good team and like the Red Sox had a chance to beat a good team so I was pretty pumped up wasn't and that was a Alex Verdugo moment that was the series before Toronto was it not. Like the, uh, the Red Sox I went in, remember. kicked the shit out of the Guardians, and then swept them. Yeah, and we were all like, "The Red, this was there." The Red Sox had reached the highest point of 2022 for them, and then 628 came, and it was that Toronto series. Mm-hmm. But we were all saying like they just swept the Guardians, one you know division leader at the time. Yeah, I mean they went on to win the division. 
But anyways, Chris Verdugo, who is uh, Alex Verdugo, his brother, uh, he tweeted <clears throat> to Jordan Leandri, who, friend of the program, former guest, you remember Jordan as the, the testicle young man assassin. Threw the first pitch at Fenway that absolutely smoked a photographer in the penis. Chris said he played with a fractured toe for the first two months of the season. <laughs> this and... is a fucking nightmare of an episode <laughs> for Jake. Jared again. It froze. How am I fro your your I... mic just dipped out that time for some reason? <laughs> We are just fucking hitting for the cycle of technical difficulties on this episode. I don't know. I'm not. I'm just holding my mic. I, don't, I mean, this mic is a piece of shit, but like, I'm not doing anything different. It feels internet connection based. It doesn't yeah. feel for me. I'm like my, the router is like up my asshole. I don't know what's happening. But I could yeah, be closer. To it definitely feels like a connection thing. I don't know. Anyways, he says, uh. Uh, players don't like talking about playing through injuries. Alex just doesn't want to go on the injured list, and sometimes it's to the detriment of his stats. But he prides himself on trying to be out there playing every day. And then he also said he's working out at Speed and Agility Center in Rancho. He's he looks lean, working on being quicker and more focused on athletic movements in his lifting routines. Boston trainers gave him a workout plan to follow, and he's doing it, and then some. Last year, we focused on strength and adding size, but the ball changes hurt him. Alex was in top 10 unluckiest hitters in Major League Baseball last year. 2023 will be a laser show. It, but if he had done this in 2019, Verdugo probably hits 25 jacks in 2019. During the juice ball days, I would say he would have hit 20 to 25. He could have. I think in this year where now the balls are at least somewhat closer back to normal, unless you're Aaron Judge, like that's where he got hurt and he fell into the Benintendi trap. It's like the Red Sox don't want you to be that guy. They want you to be Mr. Hit close to 300. Walk a ton. Maybe steal 10 to 15 bags and play good defense. Mm. But I think the big thing with Verdugo there is you look at the numbers. Like you mentioned those first two months of the season, right? And how much that affected him in kind of a really unlucky April and then and obviously not right May threw everything off. The numbers are crazy. It was 302, 355, 434, 789, eight jacks, a 121 weighted runs created plus. That's Alex Verdugo. Like after June 1st, that's the guy you want the Red Sox were hoping for. That's what they dreamt on. Go be this just really solid Nick Markakis like outfielder. Now he has to play right field this year. You're asking a lot for him in that department. Mm -hmm. But when he was healthy, he didn't look that bad in right field last year. He held his own. Yeah, he didn't stand out. Wasn't Christian Arroyo. <laughs> it's not nice. It's real. <clears throat> Alec Verdugo batting fifth. Batting sixth. Your new starting center fielder, who, by the way, if Trevor Story does come back, you can put Trevor Story back at short. You can move Kike back to center, and then Duvall can go to a fourth outfield spot. Um, that's assuming that you know he's he's. Uh, th there's a lot of what ifs there. That's assuming that he's not worthy of of being an everyday guy. He might end up being Hunter Renfro 2021 for you. Who knows? And then then you've got your decisions to make. With is second base a place that you can move uh, Kike to or? Uh, or you can put Trevor Story at second base to ease him back in, and then you have um, Kike at short. Like the, you, you're going to have options, but it all depends on like, do they trade for Kim? Because then that that complicates things a little bit. But it's a good problem to have because he's a good fucking player. Got to make your team better. And, and you got him for one year, so it's maybe in this world, like he has a really solid. Maybe he's not standout, but it's a good first half. The Red Sox realize, hey, we're probably you know we're not competing this year. Maybe they sh they ship him out at the deadline. And they can get something for him. And you do that because you have story at short. Say you have, you know, Kike back in center and, you know, it all plays out that way. You know, you found that if you go the route of a complimentary piece at second base with Joey Wendell and Christian Arroyo, like you have options there. It's just there's really nothing to lose in Adam Duvall. Like it's a good risk to take. And if it doesn't work out, great. The Red Sox, they're not going to win a championship this year. If he's great or bad, it's not really going to change that outlook one way or the other.
There's only really yeah. stuff to gain. Adam Duvall, <clears throat> like I, I think, you know, I, 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 when when the signing happened, I was like, yeah, this is this is great. Like I, this is exactly what I wanted the Red Sox to do, given the position that they're in. And then you've got you know the random dickheads being like, well, he hit like fucking two fourteen last year, blah, blah. He had a down year. He had a down year last year, but that's not to say that he can't have a bounce back, and that's not to say that he's not a needed piece for where your team is at right now. He is. Uh, you need you needed a, a guy that could play center field because if Kike was coming into the infield, you you didn't have a center fielder anymore, and that's not like a shot at at Jaron Duran because who knows if Jaron Duran is going to be in Worcester to start the year. You don't know. Um, <clears throat> so now you've got Duvall in center, and again, a necessary a necessary thing that you had to do. It's not a, it's not a big splash, but it's you know to Pete's point earlier. Like how how much credit do you really want to give the Red Sox for finding players who actually play the position? Like you're just simply you're doing the bare minimum by filling out a lineup card by having players that you don't have to be like, all right, we have to put this second baseman in this outfield spot. Like you're you're finding players for the right spots, which is great. Uh, Tristan Casas batting seventh, your first baseman on opening day. Do you think that there's any chance that it's not him? No, he he'd have to forget how to play baseball in spring training, and with the way like things- say say Bob has a monster spring and Casas uh, scuffles in Fort Myers, you you think that no matter what, it's Casas. I yeah, understand. I think they know they look at this year as the chance for him to get his feet wet. If he struggles like Dustin Pedroia, he struggles like Dustin Pedroia. This is the time to do it. You know, if you're on a team that had championship aspirations, it's a different conversation. If he's going to struggle, let him get the struggles out now. He showed last year in September, like the batting average wasn't great, but he was 20, 20% above league average as a hitter. He was walking and walking and walking. 20% walk rate. The only hitter better over that stretch from when he debuted was Aaron Judge in terms of walk rate. So mm-hmm. I think he'll be fine there. The defense at first base is also a big thing. It's just this is time for him to figure it out. And maybe it takes a month or two, but he'll be one of the best hitters on the team by the end of the year. I have no doubt in my mind. Mm-hmm. Batting eighth, Christian Arroyo, second baseman. We'll see. Give him a shot. Give my guy Christian Arroyo a shot. That's all I'm saying. So let him let him be the guy that tells you that he shouldn't be the guy. Don't tell him he's not the guy without giving him the chance to be the guy. I, I think uh, he was another guy. I went and looked at his stats after he came back from that groin injury. Uh, mm-hmm. And a lot better, I think, than people forget because, you know, a lot of people weren't watching the Red Sox at that point. I don't blame them. You know, it was a tough point in the season. See if I can find it. Yeah. Christian Arroyo, 45 games, you know, finish off the season after the left groin strain. He had 329, 355, 451, 806. It was a 121 weighted runs created plus. Pretty good. Same as Alex Verdugo from June on. Mm -hmm. He gives you that. You're thrilled. Pumped. But Jared, the the question goes there. Would you rather Arroyo get a shot or do you want a shortstop? You can't have both. What do you mean? Because Kike is going to be the second baseman then. If they get Kim or they get Andrews, then her, or Kike will be your second baseman almost yeah. every day. <clears throat> yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. I want Arroyo to get a shot. I believe in Christian Arroyo. I do. Christian Arroyo is not some like journeyman slapdick. He's a former first rounder who's been waiting for his chance to prove what he can do at the big league level. And I feel like in short spurts, he's proven what he can do at the big league level. Can you do it over 162 is the question. He's proven to be able to do it over spurts. We need 162 guys. I think Christian Arroyo is a 162 guy. But <clears throat> the the only thing I would say is that's a lot of ifs. If you're saying you're hoping Kike Hernandez stays healthy, who was not healthy last year, mm-hmm. Christian Arroyo needs to stay healthy, and Adam Duvall, who was not healthy last year, needs to stay healthy. All that says to me is there's plenty of opportunity on the club. It's going to be opportunity. Give me a little more, sta- or you know, just stableness, and I'll be happy. Just a little more stability. stability that's the word. Mm-hmm. It's a hard one. 
sneaks up on you. Close to stableness. <clears throat> and then, batting ninth, aka the catcher spot. Is it Alfaro? Is it McGuire? Is it Wong? Does anyone care? I don't know that I feel strong. I just want Alfaro on this team because of the vibes and because of his hair. So you're kicking Connor Wong to AAA? Uh, I, I mean, if you were to power rank, if you were to power rank these catchers, Alfaro is probably third. But I don't care. This is a vibes team. And he's, if in terms of vibes, he's one. And then McGuire and Wong don't even register. Like, Wong is not a vibes guy at all. Like, he's, like, the, what, when he hit his first big league homer, and then Christian Arroyo was in the clubhouse pretending to be a reporter and he was asking him questions and he just, like, didn't laugh at all. <laughs> I can't have those vibes all in right. the clubhouse. Wait, wait. Before we start this Connor Wong slander, I do want to say that's not slander. That happened. That, it, that, that objectively I, happened in real life. I think Connor Wong is very well respected in the clubhouse and amongst the pitchers. And Rich Hill has said kind of consistently he thinks Connor Wong could be a leader on this team. Like one of those guys nope. that steps up and nope. fills that role over time. Nope. No. He's no. Not. Nope. Is that informed? No, that's just me looking at him not having a sense of humor in that particular spot. Like I think it. So put it this way. I could be wrong. Right, because it, it, I think if I were if I were my age right now, back in two thousand and one or two, or no, even before that, whenever Jason Veritek first came up to the Red Sox, dude is super serious, captain business all the fucking time. Like I'd probably look at a guy like Jason Veritek if someone tried to like fuck around with him, he probably wouldn't have laughed either. And I mean, he was the literal captain, wore the C on his chest for the Boston Red Sox and won two World Series titles with the team. So maybe I'm wrong about Connor Wong being too serious to be a leader. Uh, But I feel like I feel like the leader has to have a little bit of personality. Like you can be Mr. Serious, Mr. Business, like show up, get your shit done and lead by example and all that. But you've got to have a little personality. I'm not saying like a complete goofball, but then maybe he is that guy. I don't know him like that. I, I've I've never really talked to him before. Maybe he is that guy uh, behind closed doors. Who knows? I think not it's me. better for the Red Sox moving forward if Connor Wong shows up this spring. But it feels very Red Sox to send Connor Wong down to AAA if he's not shining and say, let's give Alfaro some run here. He is a clubhouse guy. The Red Sox kind of need it right now. You can use him and Wong, even though Alfaro's defense is kind of concerning for me. Good, you know, pop time to second base, but he's been negative defensive run saved every single year of his career except 2018. I don't care. It's vibes. The the vibes. It's a backup catcher. Like, let's see. That's going to be one of the spring training battles to watch. But I hope yeah, if Juan just... can do what he did at, you know, in AAA at the end of last year, where he was one of the best hitters in minor league baseball before he got called up, that's that would be nice. I would prefer it. For that. me, for me, I think it's more of a competition between McGuire and Alfaro than Wong and Alfaro. Okay. Like I if if you were to ask me, you've got three guys. And and maybe it's a situation like a couple of years ago where like you didn't really have a starting catcher. Like Christian Vasquez caught half the season and then Puecki caught half the season. Um <clears throat> maybe it's something like that where there is no ever like no, there's not a catcher that's catching 110 games, but you're kind of divvying it up almost 50-50. But the one guy that I want to for sure have 50 to me would be Connor Wong. Even with how strong Roos McGuire was to end last year? He hit. I mean, there's no doubt he can hit. Can you sustain that? I don't think. I think the more thing is he's stable behind the plate. I think that's something they probably are going to kind of cling towards. Because I, I like Connor Wong, but didn't look the smoothest behind the plate at times last year. Looked like he was still adjusting. He can call a game, and it seems like he handles them well. But... Reese McGuire has been consistently just really solid behind the plate. 
he feels like the steady veteran out of these three that you can depend on. I think Reese will be on the team no matter what. I, I do think that battle is going to be between Connor Wong and Alfaro. Because you can just send Wong down and say, hey, go prove it to us again. You kn- Alfaro isn't going to turn into some god. like that. That's not what he is. But if he's what he was last year for the Padres, fine. You're a fine backup catcher. I think you hope, and maybe where Wong, they start to look at him as a versatility piece. You can do maybe a little more with him. I don't know. But I think they'll be willing to let Wong go down and prove it again if he has a rough spring. I think McGuire that, will be catching is, on opening day. Is that the only competition really in spring? Like everything else is pretty much set, huh? Probably, unless like you see what happens. It depends what they do up the middle. But like Yoshida's going to be in left. Like Verdugo's going to be in right. Do they get a platoon for Christian Arroyo? And maybe Arroyo goes so nuts it changes the conversation. But if they go get Elvis <laughs> Andrews, it's like, all right, well, <laughs> he's going to be your shortstop and PK will be your second baseman. Yeah. The last bullpen spot, maybe. Can Ryan Brazier find a way to claw himself back into this? Yeah, they just gave him fucking two million bucks in arbitration. And the rotation. I'll throw the rotation conversation. Because you have James Paxson kind of sitting on the outside. Tanner Houck will Is enter he? as a starter. James Paxson know. might be the only surefire starting pitcher yeah. you've got. It, it, it's tough, but Thanks. you start going down the list here. It's like, th- this rotation is very full. Sale? He's definitely starting. Pavetta, definitely starting. Kluber, you gave $10 million. He's definitely starting. Whitlock, they've said he's a starter. He's, no, but he's definitely not starting. All right. He's definitely starting, according to the Red Sox. <laughs> and then Bayo. They've, uh, they've lied to us a lot. They also said that Xander Bogarts was the top priority, and he wasn't. <laughs> yes, but I think this is what the Red Sox front office really wants, is Garrett Whitlock to be a starter, so that extension looks genius. Which it will. It's going to look so stupid. It looks so stupid when they fucking break them. It feels like Paxson's going to be, if they're not going to go six-man rotation, which is why those BOH comments are big, then is it Paxson kind of stretching out in the bullpen and becoming that multi-inning or long, you know, long relief kind of arm? Maybe you match him with someone and you kind of have that hybrid situation you did a year ago with Tanner Howe. They've got options <laughs> for sure. I just don't know that I'm super stoked about many, if any. Like, I, again, we'll see. We're going to find out. When, when you look at that rotation, again, I, we were talking about that, I don't know, like a month ago or whenever they signed Kluber. I mean, like, imagine in 2016 if the Red Sox had a rotation of Chris Sale, Corey Kluber, and James Paxton, how pumped we would be. Like, we would be talking about. Like, we wouldn't even be talking about World Series. We'd be talking about how many. Like, why does like how it, do we figure this out? Isn't there a world where Chris Sale shows up and he looks like no. he did, let's say, in Tampa Bay? Did you already say no, Jared? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> fuck you. Uh, yeah, no, Jared. Where Chris Sale looks like he did in Tampa? You know, five scoreless innings. Where sure. Corey Kluber looks closer to his three fifty FIP than the what four three ERA that he had. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. James Paxson's like, yeah, I'm I'm healthy for now. Like, I, I can throw and it looks normal. Like, I'm sitting mid 90s and we're mm-hmm. all like, all right, like, it's looking. It's, it's yeah. a rotation. Hey, I'm telling you this right now. That's what's going to happen. Sale's going to stay healthy. Paxton's going to stay healthy. Kluber's going to stay healthy. This team could win 95 games, <laughs> 250 innings each. That's a little much. I would say like 230. Okay. All right. We don't want to shoot too high here. Yeah. So they're all going to basically <laughs> throw their careers away so that the 2023 Red Sox can be a serviceable baseball team. Championship baseball team. Sorry. I mean, at least they play in a division that sucks. So. Thank God. Well, hey, I, I don't like to wish injuries on anyone, but the Yankees got a little weaker this week. Frankie Montas, a guy that we talked about here. That's that's bad for us because he sucks. I'd rather he was healthy and out there sucking <laughs> than, than on the injured list with a shoulder injury. But what, what are you going to do? We'll be better than the Orioles. That's a start. Okay. A if you something. can look at the Orioles rotation, tell me you think they're better than the Red Sox. You have problems. Do the Red Sox, again, have Corey Kluber, Chris Sale, and James Paxson in the same rotation? 
They fucking do. That's that's murderer's row in 2016. Can they do it in 2023? Why not? I don't know. Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer, they're all still doing it. Why can't? Why not us? Jared, do you do you fare Kyle Gibson? Uh, grow up, Pete. Do you fear? Do you fear Kyle Gibson? I don't know who the fuck that is. So exactly, no. <laughs> Jared. Let's try it again. Do you fear Dean Kramer? The cream machine. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> Pete. But he did have a good year last year, right? Mm. He was pretty good last 323 year. Three twenty three ERA. The metrics were really bad, if I recall, though. Okay, but. I mean, a 3.23 ERA might lead the Red Sox next year. All right. Well, what's the FIP? 3.80. All right. 6.2 K per nine. He's fine. That's what I'm saying. He's cream fine. He's fine. Don't, don't disrespect the fucking cream machine. He uh, sucks, but like he he was good last year. Back end. Kyle Bradish, he fucking blew last year. Now, maybe it clicks for him. Let's see if this is the year. Tyler no. Wells. I've never heard of any. 4.25. <laughs> I'm sorry. You, I'm not- you, you've heard of them because... I, I made do remember fun of all of them on like the 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 look uh, ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I do remember. Uh, I do remember Bradish because you're every time you go Bradish like or Bradish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All I'm saying is, I look at that rotation and I don't sit there and say, "Wow, this team's easily going to be better than the Red Sox." I can't. Bradish or Bradish. We could really do a a who he play for type segment with me. Just <laughs> yeah. names. I have no idea. You can just be like, is this person in the league? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is this person on a team? Does he exist? Uh, all right. Well, that was that was breaking down the 2023 Boston Red Sox uh, opening day starting lineup, which is subject to change. If they make a trade, they sign an Elvis Andrews or a Jose Iglesias. Where are we at on that? What was what was like? I know that they're they've been linked to them. They they've called right. Yeah, that's it. We we got uh Mike Rodriguez is his name right? Um, who said that the Red Sox were connected to Iglesias last week, and then Heyman this week had them attached to uh, Elvis Andrews, and I think Chad Jennings and a couple of those guys did as well. I only trust Chad Jennings. Fantastic writer, but did you see what podcast he was on this week? Oh, tell me it wasn't Catillo's. It was. Oh, come on. I know. It's a bad look for you. I'm going to be real with you. For me? Yeah, dude. You you said he was ours. And he went he went to our competition, the guy we kicked off. He's not our competition. There's... Chris Cotillo is not our competition. There's like 75 people who listen to that, and like 30 of them are family members. He got his guy. <clears throat> We well, get? we lost Pat. Yeah. Pat might be doing yeah. that podcast. Imagine Pat just shows up on on Chris Cotillo's podcast after you said a, that he was a great friend who was loyal and would would never cross you and and go to a a competitor. Just goes to your biggest rival. I don't think that's my biggest rival. Not your biggest rival, but like your biggest enemy. No, we made up. Did I not say that on the podcast? He <laughs> called me and apologized. For real? Wow. Uh huh. I don't. I can't imagine him being non-sarcastic in his tone. Well, ah, uh, I ran him. I ran into him at the Winter Classic, and he was like, "I don't know if I'm allowed to. I don't know if you're allowed to talk to me." <laughs> Good. <laughs> did I? Did I scar him? <laughs> Jared, you said some very mean things that night. I know you weren't completely of mind, mm-hmm. but. You know, if someone listened to that back, it would not be good. I was mad. I was mad. But I guess it doesn't even matter now because the podcast that he went on is no longer a podcast. (laughs) Do you hear that? Wait, wait, what do you mean? Starting Nine put out their last episode today. Oh, wow. Mm. Hmm. How you feeling about that? A little sad. Why? Is it because it's like your baby? It's not my baby though. Like like Section Ten's my baby, 
Starting nine, I didn't come up with that name. They kind of just gave it to us. Feels more uh, corporate. Yeah, because it, it was. They wanted a generic baseball name so that it was like more marketable and easy to find and whatever. Uh, but I don't know. Me and Dallas, we fucking put a lot of hard work into building that brand. And uh, to see that it's dead, I don't know. That it, it feels a lot to me like the, the professional wrestling business where it's like you're never really retired. But it feels like this iteration of it is dead, which whatever, you know, they gave it a shot. It's it's not huh? it's it's not easy to build okay. a baseball podcast like the baseball podcast space is super fucking competitive. There's a lot of people trying to do it, which is why I found it very like the that like that thread on the Red Sox Reddit page that was shitting on us. It's like all you guys wish that you had a podcast like this. All of you. Everyone in here that's shitting on us, you wish that you were us, and that's why you're mad. Um, but no, I still I'm still friends with Carl. I it's I haven't talked to him. I didn't I found out it when everyone else did when the podcast came out, but uh I don't know. It, it's it's almost like uh like if you got married, you were married for eight years, and then you got divorced, and then your ex wife got remarried. And then she just got divorced again. So it's like, I guess, I don't know. It was weird to see her out with someone else gallivanting around. But you don't want her to be, not, be unhappy. You don't want her to but fail. I, yeah, I don't want her to be unhappy. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't want her to fail. Uh, but it was weird to see her with someone else, I guess, would be the comparison. So now that she's single again, uh, well, is she... I, I guess there's a little more. Is like she single or a piece dead or did she die? <laughs> I think she got hit by a car. <laughs> like maybe there's a chance she could be revived. Like I'm, I'm not saying dead forever, but definitely yeah. unresponsive. She's definitely under. <laughs> yeah. She's in a coma right now. Yeah. She's in a coma. Uh, so yeah, I it's a little weird. It's a little weird, but you know, I feel like like section 10 is just at the bottom of the ocean and the divers are, like how do we how do we raise this ship back up? They're still trying to figure out how do we get this ship back up. But <laughs> starting nine is more just like, oh, that's my ex wife that's in a coma. <laughs> I don't want to bring up police Titanic stuff, but you are kind of like Titanic. How do you say it? Titanic. Titanic. <laughs> Titanic. What do you call it? <laughs> Titanic. What is this? What do you mean? What do you call it? We call it by its name, and it's not Titanic. <laughs> the Titanic. <laughs> Can oh, someone say it correctly? Titanic. Titanic. Yeah, that thing. It's <laughs> Titanic. Titanic. I have an issue with like a lot of easy to say words. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, we know. I, I'll be honest. There was another situation <laughs> where this happened to me this week. What was the word? You ever hear of the Econo Lodge? No. It's a the hotel. Econo Lodge? Yeah, I, I, I thought it was Econo. I had the same issue with the word epitome. I used to say epitome on radio. Yeah. <laughs> on I, radio, I was saying I, that. I have a, an experience with that with uh, Arai. I used to say Ari. Okay. You did, I, I'm the one that caught you. You did that on this show. Oh, I thought it was brunch. It was you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All you right. Said, you said Ari, and I was like, what? I was like, did you just you just said that word how it looks when it's spelled? <laughs> Damn, I thought it was brunch. I thought DJ called me out on, on it and he, he was like, I don't remember that, but it sounds like something I do. No, it was you. All right. That's good to know. Yeah, I remember it was it was a horrifying moment being like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. That's way so, worse than Titanic. No, it's not. Titanic. Well, you have like nine of them, so <laughs> is it By the way. Worse? That's not way worse because awry is looks like how it's spelled. Titanic <laughs> is how it's spelled. And it was also like yeah, the most famous movie of icon. all time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like the most famous shipwreck of all time, which became the most famous movie of all time. Uh, I've yet to is, see the film. That's fine. But you've heard people talk about it, right? Wait, no, no, no. Pete, you're just going to let that slide that he's never fucking seen Titanic. Like, before? I, mean, hours. I mean, it's Milliken. Am I expecting him to see the Titanic? No. Is it wild that he hasn't? Yeah, I guess. But like it's it is literally the most popular movie ever made ever, ever, ever. But it also like 
Yeah, but it, it it was like in our growing up for us, like he probably missed the boat a little bit. No pun oh, intended. Hey, see, great. that would have saved his life if he did. <laughs> uh, definitely would have been third class. Jake, have you seen <laughs> Titanic? It's <That's> fucked. <laughs> He has no idea what you're talking about because he doesn't, no, fucking doesn't know how to pronounce the name of the boat. All right, yeah. Jake, have you ever seen Titanic? <laughs> yeah, of course I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Just such Fuck a you, Jake. Such Fuck a you. devastating. Stick with me. We are the younger generation on this podcast. No, I knew Jake obviously has seen Titanic. He's obviously maybe you know what? Maybe that's what we'll do. We'll have a we'll have a Titanic night at, at my house. It's a good yeah, movie. I, it's a great movie. It's the first time I ever saw Titty. Was Titanic? Oh. Yeah, Kate Winslet, nineteen ninety seven. I was eight years old. First titty I ever did see, and I saw Titanic in theaters eight times. Oh my god! What? Eight. So I saw it seven times. It in I think when it first came out in theaters, it was in theaters for like a full year. Yeah, yeah. It, it they did not left, take it, it out of theaters. theaters because it was just making so much money. Yeah. So Titanic, when it first came out in theaters, uh. I saw it seven times because it was in theaters for like, I'm not even exaggerating a year. Yeah. It's like when, when like a Broadway show does well and it's on Broadway for like fucking 14 years. Yeah. That's what Titanic was it, at the movies. Correct. And then I, it was either in 2011 or 2012. They re-released it in theaters again. And I went back and saw it in theaters again. And I just heard that recently they're talking about putting it back in theaters for the anniversary. Perfect. I'm ready. We nah, should, I'm not we waiting for that. It. We're gonna go watch. We're gonna watch it next weekend. We can do it. I I, I want to learn because I know a lot of people speak very highly. Just a little movie. SummerSlam and Titanic. <laughs> a nice little Royal Rumble. Feature. Royal Rumble. Oh, whatever. It's fucking sorry. January. Whatever. Dumbass. It's uh, summer. SummerSlam state of mind. in January. That was almost as mind. dumb as, as Tyler saying <laughs> Titanic. That was my bad. <laughs> we're that we're, in, we're in a rough position. If I'm the smart guy on this podcast, depends what we're talking about. I lack culture. Fair. Fair. Yeah, you lack a lot of things. Not not a lot, some. Titanic. Try to play that off like like it, there's any excuse to not know how to say the word Titanic <laughs> is crazy. Crazy. <laughs> there's a like, lot of it's also it's, it's fine also if you've never not... seen it. It's fine. Like I can I can let it go if you've never seen it. But like if you don't know how to say it, you've heard you have people to talk know about it. the Titanic. Well, that's how you know I'm not and a poser. It's just a word. It's not just the ship. It's also a word. It just means big. <laughs> I missed that day in class, apparently. Like, you know the word Titan? Well, apparently. <laughs> Fuck. You know the word Titan, right? Yeah, Titan. That's yeah. what it, I mean. It, it, that's the, the, the stem word. It comes from that, yeah. Oh. What is that the, the prefix? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's what that fucking means. Titanic. Titanic. I think I just said it weirdly but it's no more... i think well yeah you did say it weirdly but I, you said it wrong <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of people listening right now that are like i understand tyler and i went through the same thing so don't be afraid to reach out to me Definitely so not. i can <laughs> don't Definitely be afraid not. to reach out to me and let me know that you also went through this. there is there's not a titanic support club uh you're no. you're reaching for a thing that does not exist literally no one <laughs> is gonna reach out and be like tyler it's okay i thought it was titanic too <laughs> I mean, if we had a, if we had merch up and running, a Titanic shirt like in the in the font of the the movie would be fucking hilarious. <laughs> it's just like you just have like Leo on the yes, ship, but he yeah. he's just like like a derp version of himself, <laughs> like Titanic, a, like, like one of those like concert shirts that they sell outside the venue mm -hmm. for like five dollars on the street. Off absolutely got to make those so just like a, <laughs> yeah. absolutely bum ass <laughs> titanic shirt that just says titanic <laughs> i'm a little embarrassed i'm a little embarrassed yeah you lie. should be that's bad that's bad that's real bad i bet you see an avatar though huh fuck no okay i haven't seen avatar. i don't watch any movie that's over two hours i haven't seen avatar i haven't seen the first one or the second one me neither. I haven't seen either. And I think James Cameron's a fucking prick. Why? What did he do? He just loves himself so much. He sucks his own dick all the time. Well, you you make the highest grossing film of all time. You can suck great, your dick all you great want. Great director. Great director. He's yeah. done a lot of work, but like just fucking you don't have to swallow your own dick all the time. 
I'm, I'm, I'm team. I'm team Cameron on this one. <laughs> you suck that dick, son. <laughs> Not even the best Avatar. Avatar: The Last Airbender. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Someone, a man of culture. I don't know what you're talking about. A lot of people will agree with that. Do we have anything else to talk about on this podcast? No, but that was a great way to end it. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good one. That's all we got. So I always uh, feel, I feel like we always end on like a, like a little pop culture thing that just was not expected or planned. I feel yeah. like I learn a lot from you guys. Well, yeah. Because you know nothing. Course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <you're, laughs> I'm a blank canvas. Yeah. Yeah. It's called being a fucking idiot. All right. Well, fuck you, Jared. I mean, Jake clearly has seen Titanic before. This is an impressive, impressive episode from Jake. Just fucking like body bagged us three times with like five words. Well, I just think if you if you've been on Earth before, you've seen Titanic, like (laughs) you could go to Antarctica and talk to talk to people who've never had a TV. They'd be like, oh, yeah, the Titanic, of course. (laughs) I don't know. Jake's passionate about the Titanic. I know it's a crazy else. thing to not know. <laughs> it's crazy. What year that happened? 1997. 1912. Well, I, I thought you t- the movie happened oh, in 1997. Okay. The the actual sinking or the movie? It took a long time for that movie to come out. What they weren't the working on it the whole time. Oh. There's a there's a movie called I think it's called A Night to Remember. And that came out, I it's believe, walk in 1958. If I got that right, that's fucking weird. Uh, a Night to Remember in 1958 was also about the Titanic sinking. I'm going to look that up right now. What was the name of it, Pete? A Walk to Remember. Oh, I thought you were correct. That's me. fucking weird, dude. I got that right. A Night to Remember a ninth in, it got released in 1958, mm-hmm. an hour and 31 minutes. That is weird. Came out to buzzer beater, December 16th, 1958. The sinking of the Titanic is presented in a highly realistic fashion in this tense British drama. The disaster is portrayed largely from the perspective of the ocean liner's second officer, Charles Lightoller. Despite numerous warnings about ice, the ship sails on with Captain Edward John Smith keeping it uh, going at a steady clip. When the doomed vessel finally hits an iceberg and crew and passengers discover that they lack enough lifeboats and tragedy follows. You're never going to believe what happens next. It, it does not say you're never going to believe what happens next. Does no. It? Oh, I'm going to no. say what? <laughs> That's a, it. I got to say that that movie was dealt a tough hand. I've never seen it. It could be a fine film. I hope it's I hope it sucks because if it's like a good movie that ends up getting just completely its own dick kicked in by the Titanic like 50 years later. Sad. Yeah. Well, so here's here's a little fun fact about A Night to Remember, which I believe was the first Titanic movie. There's another movie called Raising the Titanic. I don't know what year that came out, but there's another movie called Raising the Titanic. But A Night to Remember came out in 1958. So at the time, they thought that the Titanic sank in one piece. So in the movie, it sinks in one piece. And they did not discover the titanic until 1985 or 1986 that was robert ballard who discovered the titanic wait like fi- fi- they didn't find it until they they 80s? didn't find it on, yes they didn't find it Damn. on ocean floor let's see I'll, I'll look that up when did they discover the titanic uh robert ballard in 1985 you know a lot about the titanic huh yeah, I have Asperger's. Um, he's best known for discovering the wreck of the Titanic in 1985. So Robert Ballard discovered the Titanic in 1985. So when they discovered it, that's when they saw that it was in two pieces on the ocean floor. So that's why in the Titanic movie in 1997, it splits. But in A Night to Remember, it does not because they didn't fucking know because damn, in the movie, it's all lit up. But if you were actually there, the fucking lights on the ship went out and the moon wasn't in the sky. All they had was like the stars. So you couldn't even see the ship splitting in half if you were actually there. So even the witnesses were like, I don't fucking know. I just know it's not here no more. Damn. That's, mm-hmm. that's fucked up. Mm-hmm. Yep. I feel like I saw the movie now. 
I can't believe that you know this much about the Titanic, but that's this is cool to know. Yeah, I was very, I was a, I was a Titanic kid. Let me ask you this: mm-hmm. How do you feel? Uh, how do you feel about the new Scream that's coming out? Uh, it's very different. Yeah, I saw the trailer, but I'll be honest with you, I don't remember anything from it. It's in, it takes place in New York. First Scream movie that doesn't take place in uh, what's the name of the the town? I forget the name of the town, but they all take they all take place in that 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 same town. Mm-hmm. And like this one, the ghost face like uses guns and shit like they can't do that. Well, th- I mean, it, it's acknowledging that like that the whole thing is like, I'm a different kind of ghost face now. And so, like, That's I don't know stupid. how to feel about it. I'm a little conflicted. You can't have you can't have a scream movie with the murder weapon being a gun, right? Like, well, it's not like all guns, but like he does use a gun in the trailer, and it it, it well, feels weird to be have like a slasher when you incorporate guns. Now that I'm thinking of it, Scream Three, yeah, Scream Three, he has a gun, but it's like he kills all of his victims with a knife, right? But then after after he takes off the mask and he's like, "It was me all along, Sydney." Like he's got a gun to like Sydney. Yeah, so he's not using it as Ghostface. He's using it as who he really is. Okay, then that's been done before. No, no, no. I'm I'm saying like that in the past that was the case, oh. but in the, in this one he uses a gun as Ghostface. Oh, I don't like that. I don't know how I feel yeah. about it yet. Yeah, that's no. You can't do that. Rules are rules. <laughs> you can't you can't be just breaking the rules like that. It's evolution, though, man. Yeah, it is. I guess it's crazy. I mean, once you get to the sixth installment, you can kind of just do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> yeah. At that point, we've we've seen we've seen a whole lot. Can't yeah. really surprise us in a lot of other ways. Once you're capping off your <laughs> second trilogy of the same franchise, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of a little bit of a different story, different rule book. I don't know. Well, I didn't I didn't expect to talk about Ghostface and the Titanic. I didn't I didn't have Robert Ballard making an appearance on today's program. I have his autograph. What? Yeah. Where? Uh he signed a Titanic postcard for me. Who is this guy? Is this the guy that found the Titanic? Mm-hmm. You have that guy's autograph? Mm-hmm. Was it like a meet and greet? <clears throat> uh no, I think my dad got it for me. I'm pretty sure Robert Ballard took James Cameron down to the wreck. Like James Cameron went to the Titanic wreck before shooting the movie and Robert Ballard was the one. Now everyone fucking goes there. I think it's like you can pay 200 or 250 grand and you can go down to see the Titanic if you want. But that's like roughly what it costs. I've thought about it. Who is it? Oh, I was gonna say, does Bill Paxton p- play uh, um, Robert Ballard? But he doesn't. He plays Brock Lovett in the movie because Bill yeah. Paxton's the guy who finds the tit- like or right. is like running the the mission to discover the Titanic or whatever. Mm-hmm. Correct. They're building a new one. Uh, they started to do it like a few years ago, and I think they like paused or like put it off or stopped. I think right. actually you gotta you know call how it something fu- else <laughs> you know how fucking <laughs> such a how bad fucking, omen. how much of a weirdo i am about the titanic so when i was in vegas for the mlb winter meetings this was what december of 18 this was remember when i like hijacked drellick's segment yes it was that trip so we were in vegas me and fucking dana b and uh there was a titanic museum there And when you're walking through the Titanic Museum, they rebuilt parts of the Titanic and the Grand Staircase, like Pete's going to know what I'm talking about, but Mm -hmm. you guys, if you didn't see it, the Grand Staircase, they rebuilt it to scale. And at the top of the Grand Staircase, there's a clock. And I looked at the clock and there's like a security guard or like a tour guide there. (laughs) Uh, making sure because it was like the stairs were roped off like you couldn't go up the stairs and there was like a tour guide there uh, making sure that no one goes up the stairs and I looked at the clock and I was like that clock 
is frozen at the time that the Titanic hit the iceberg. And she was like, no one has ever no, like called that out before. <laughs> it's insane. So if this mm-hmm. goes very poorly, you could be giving tours to the, Titanic, the Titanic Museum, Museum in Las Vegas. You could have yeah, such so. an interesting brain. Yeah, there's just certain things that interest me and I just get very... You, uh, you like know about four things, but you know everything about those four things. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, I feel like that's how my brain works, too. No, you know about one thing. And it's baseball. <laughs> and you know about nothing else. It's true. You didn't have to say it like that. <laughs> you didn't have to say it like that. I'll, I'll, I'll be willing to, to, uh, to, to, to change that stance when you prove that you know about anything else. There will be a day. <laughs> and it'll be my Yeah, day. like, work at least, like, like, Jay Stu... Like he's got the Celtics and he's got pro wrestling. Like, what's your other thing? It's a work in progress. What do you Coming mean? Get, what what like do you mean, you, my other thing? There's got to be another thing where it's like, yeah, like I obviously I'm obsessed with baseball, but like low, low key, like I'm also like super into puzzles. Like, oh yeah, what, like, what, I'm a nerd. I read like manga and like shit like that. Like, what you the see, fuck is that? It's like anime, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, you see like the Naruto poster right there. No. Well, that's what that is. That like I have a whole bookshelf like, over here. Avatar so the Last Airbender is an anime. Exactly. That that like that's the stuff like I grew up on. I was a nerdy kid. I, I I like baseball. That's my passion. But when I wasn't doing baseball, I was being nerdy. So you were like, into anime. Gotcha. Yes. Death Note. You never watched Death Note? I've I've seen Death Note. Okay. Pete, see, someone with culture. It's a gr- it's a great I'm show. Yeah. Great anime. What's Attack it called? Attack on Titan. Death, Death Note. Note. Jake, you ever see Death Note before? <laughs> yeah, it's actually phenomenal. Okay. Thank you. I, Let's go. Jake. Right, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. Yeah, fuck you, Jared. I I just welcomed you no, into my house no. to watch Titanic. I don't give that's a like, fuck. Culture that's like yourself. The probably, that is probably the most intimate experience that I can have heterosexually, and you just said, go fuck myself. Uh, listen, if you Me I'll come over and bringing you into my home to watch Titanic is by far the most intimate experience that I can have heterosexually. I, I respect that, and I appreciate that, and I thank you for that. Now, mm-hmm. will you come to my place, and we can watch Death Note together? No, but we can watch it here. Okay, that's fine. I have a nice room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I, you would like it, Jared. I'm telling okay. you. Okay. Right. I'm, I'm Pete, Jake, two people who have seen it, Jared would like it. Yeah. I think it would be interesting to you. Of interest to you. Okay. Pete would know. I feel like Pete's got a solid <laughs> grasp on how my brain is working. All right. Well, uh, I'm sad that you guys won't be at Winter Weekend. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm totally not looking forward to a two-hour drive to fucking Springfield. I'll tell you that right now. But once I get there, it should be a good time. And uh, hopefully, maybe a move or two is made before the next episode. If a move is not made before the next episode, you know what? I'll, I'll get us a guest. I'll get us a guest. I don't know who it's going to be. I don't have someone like in the back of my mind right now. But I'll I'll get a guest for the next episode if the Red Sox don't sign someone or make some sort of trade. Next episode will be within a month of the first spring training game. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> Opening days in March, right? March yeah. 30th. Last day of the month. Yeah. Damn. Wait, so like the like spring training week would be in like February. Or. Yeah. All right. I think the 15th is the official report date for pitchers and catchers. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say, unless it, it, unless I'd say there's a good chance that I'm, I'm down to join for the week in spring training because that'll be okay. before the playoffs. Okay. All right. Jake, you want to come? Hey, I'm down. Okay. All right. We're all going. I'm going to get a nice tan. You deserve it, King. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'll see you next week. Buenas noches, amigos.